Welcome to Snowmobile Sessions Live on YouTube and your favorite podcast platforms. It's the number one destination to learn about snowmobiling, network with other sledders, and have an awesome time doing it. We'll meet other snowmobilers that share your passion and show your fan photos along the way. Snowmobile Sessions Live. Enjoy the ride. This episode of Snowmobile Sessions Live is brought to you by Energy Power Sports. They're Oakville's full-line BRP dealer with sales and service to all BRP models and so much more. Energy Power Sports always has the fun in store with a wide selection of clothing, parts, and accessories for all your power sports passions. Make Energy Power Sports your source for Can-Am off-road ATV and side-by-sides. Can-Am on-road Riker and Spider, including the Sporty F3S, Sea-Doo Watercraft and Switch pontoon boats and Alumacraft fishing boats powered by Mercury Marine. Put yourself on a Manitou pontoon or a widescape stand-up snowmobile. Energy Power Sports is the home for Lynx and Ski-Doo snowmobiles for the entire family. Do you feel the energy? Energy Power Sports, 879 Cranberry Court, Oakville, Ontario, or online energypowersports.ca. Hey, welcome back. It's episode 101. We made it this far. First episode of 2024, and uh, we've got the true legend in the world of snowmobile joining us tonight. He's not only a Hall of Famer, but a former oval and ice drag racer. He's left an incredible mark on the sport. He's from Nova Scotia, Canada, he, and he earned his place in the Cape Breton Sport Heritage Hall of Fame. Welcome, accomplished and passionate Gord McDonald, founder of Gord's Garage and the di- driving force behind the renowned 88X racing team. Your your career is nothing short of extraordinary. So welcome aboard, Gord. Well, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm really glad your audio came back for that. That was a terrific introduction. It it certainly hasn't come back yet because it's not the mic I wanted. So I don't know what happened there. I'm, I apologize to everybody for that. We we're doing so well, you know. But what what can you do? We'll just we'll just plug away. So Gord, tell us uh, tell us a bit about Gord's Garage, how it all got started, and Wow, that's a that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> it's it's been obviously snowmobile lifelong uh, passion of mine, and uh, the garage is the comfortable spot for sure. So uh, my plan was, you know, once I retired from mainstream, that uh, I would uh, enjoy myself in the garage, and uh, things kind of ramped up quickly. <laughs> Retirement was short lived. So Gord's Garage has been uh, busy, and we we're, we're not a uh, I'll say we're not a regular shop. We're not a repair shop. We don't fix broken sleds. Uh, we just do high performance work or handling work or turbos or flashes or anything to anything to kind of make a guy's life in the sled world a little more enjoyable. So when we started on this, and we didn't have any online presence whatsoever which is kind of a local thing and the guy who set us up there he said well you know you're gonna you're gonna need a slogan so uh we come up with we make fast faster and uh my son told me he said you know what that's a terrific slogan for you dad he said that really just describes who you are what you do and uh, so we're going with that and uh it's been uh, a real nice ride uh since sure well, that's the thing, and I, uh, Corey Jinx introduced us, you know, just last week, and yeah. and uh, I I just Google searched your name, and one of the videos that I recall watching is your snowmobile suspension setup video, and it's from a few years ago. It's it's got to be several years old now. It Maybe is, it's yeah, close to a decade. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> it's like that old. <laughs> well, it, it had to be eight because it was when I bought my twenty twelve. And okay. I bought it used, right? So okay. um, it was. I was looking for ways to set up that SC5 suspension, and and your video is in there. I believe you were yep. you were looking at an R Motion sled, so it was yep. obviously newer than that. But yeah, and I was like, that's the guy. That's awesome. That's guy. But <laughs> what a small snowmobile world! And your your good friends with our, our friend uh, John Sherard from Accelerated Technology, and yeah, you know, there's yeah. quite a bit of overlap there. How 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 does your business and something like that or another 
performance, you know, person like that or supplier go hand in hand? Yeah, for us, it was it was a match made in heaven, I suppose, uh, geographically. I mean, we're way out here on the East Coast. And uh, I bought some products from John, you know, in the last couple of years, was very impressed with uh, the product. And, uh, you know, we talked about, you know, doing a couple little projects together. And uh, of course, when the 850 Turbo came out, that was uh, an ideal project for us to work together on. And I can't say enough about, you know, his team and his expertise. It certainly made my job a lot easier of trying to find, you know, what I thought the ideal trail setup would be for that particular sled. So, um, you know, it's, it's nice when you can partner with, uh, I'll say the premier guys in our industry. And, uh, that's what I tried to do when we did the Gord's garage thing. You know, we, we did stuff with jaws and we did stuff with STM and hurricane precision EFI, like, we tried to be with all the main players that are knowledgeable and are passionate about the sport because that's what I'm all about is uh, trying to, well, if I can make it faster or turn better or go sharper or climb higher or you name it, if we can improve it, I'm, I'm all for that. What do you say that your specialty is? Like, like John's suspension, where do you, yep. what is your uh, specialty? Well, I, I spend a lot of time in the clutching side of things. Like that was kind of what I was, I guess, trained for, I was uh, involved, my previous was, I started out as a mechanic, so I'm a hands-on guy, probably the last, the last of the, you know, you ride it, you wrench it, you race it, and uh, that's the way it was when I started out racing in the mid-70s, and, uh, you know, now it's uh, obviously a lot more technology, higher tech, uh, you know, there's bigger crews, you've got guys who just drive sleds, I mean, you know, when I started racing, obviously it was the riders worked on the sled. It was all outdoors. There was no trailers. It was, <laughs> it was the raw seventies. I mean, but you know, I look at it as I think I was born at just the right time. You know, 1959, I was born and uh, Skidoo started producing sleds. So that <laughs> means I got to start racing when I was around 14. And uh, when we started racing, it was just, for me, uh, it's it's a lifelong dream. I always want, always wanted to race, and uh, you know, you really gotta want to race if you live in uh, Sydney, Nova Scotia, because I'm not, I'm so far off the trail, you know. And uh, I think that's when I look back, maybe at uh, my early race and things. You know, I started thinking about that today when we were talking. You know, when you when you travel 14, 15, 25 hours to get to a race, you know, you're not going there to go come second. You know, <laughs> it's so <laughs> far to go. And, uh, you know, that's I was super driven, super competitive, no matter what I was into. And I think that a lot of that comes back from, uh, you know, the distance that that I had to travel to race. So, um, you know, uh, you just got to put the time in and I'm not a, I'm not a quitter. That's for sure. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so I think sometimes, you know, being off the beaten track maybe gives you a little bit more drive, uh, you know, to make sure everything is right and attention to detail. Cause you know, most of the, most of the races are won in the garage and uh, you know, if you're not prepared, you're not going to win races. And uh, I like being prepared and you start getting details are important. And if I want to win, I got to be, I got to be sharp. So I, I think my, my training and my background as a mechanic certainly helped. And then we got involved in a Skidoo dealership. Uh, I guess about 83, we opened that. And uh, I suppose when I think about this, it's, it probably was more of a, uh, a front for the racing deal, you know? It, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think Gord Sports Center was uh, a front for Gord Sports Center racing for a lot of years. But I was the, very the fortunate. Laund the, laund to, the laundering yeah. component of it, is it? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, you know, if you can turn your hobby into your uh, job or occupation, um, you know, I've, I've been very, very fortunate in that way. Yeah, for sure. Corey Jinx is in the chat. He's, he's saying he hopes his sled make you make a difference with it. <laughs> <laughs> well 
I, I haven't seen Corey ride. Is, 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 is he worth making a difference for? I don't know, but you know how the ski has got those new hand guards out and it has the hazard flasher mode. That's oh. what he's going to, he's going to ride with that on the whole time. Just so that oh, it's like a slow, slow moving vehicle. Is oh, okay. Gonna... You're not saying he's a cautious rider. You're just saying he's a slow moving <laughs> rider. <laughs> I'm just I somehow kidding. got a feeling that he's not that guy. <laughs> I've I've ridden with him twice and I and I've never ri ridden with him so put it that way he <laughs> he was ahead so on the turn I, 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 I believe that yeah <laughs> yeah so we've got quite a few friends in the house right now Lapointe eight, Ski Doo eight hundred R was the first in the house he says Happy New Year to everybody Wisco Sledhart and Massa it's always not too far behind we got um, who else is in here Tim V he says Happy New Year. Uh, I've seen a couple of new names here as well uh, as we get going on here. Um, just got to get going. There's a lot of chatting going on. Corey Brock, of course, he's back. Mike Galitz, he's in the house. Uh, what else? Whaley Boys. That sounds like it's out your way, Whaley Boys. Uh, DP Rocks, he's welcome aboard, Drew. That's my son. Uh, um, what else have we got? There's a couple other new names in here. Oh, I got a. I got a super chat for buck 99, no sound. I can go out and buy a new microphone for that at the dollar store. That's great. Someone Thanks. Reminding you of that? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Just fly low. Who else we got in here? Uh, there's a few other ones. Corey Jinx, of course. Uncle Buck. Good evening, Uncle Buck. And Mrs. Uncle Buck's usually sit right beside him watching this. And uh, I'm probably scrolling through a ton here. Nathan M. Well, welcome aboard. Happy New Year. Uh, who else do we got here? Rob Overholt, uh, Joe Caraco, 422, Slobies in the house, another YouTuber from down south. Um, Greg Kelly, of course, and all the we, we booked another couple peop more people into the, uh, the Sportsman's Lodge last week, too. Not even promoting it, just words getting out. Uh, there is another off-the-cuff adventure that Jamie, he's in there. We'll just keep going here. But thanks a lot for joining us, everybody. We've got a good chat uh, going on there. And everybody's, uh, oh, off-the-cuff. Thanks a lot. We've got a $10 super chat there. Good. Must know Terry Clattenburg. He's a good friend of mine. You know Terry? Excellent. We got the thumbs up on Terry there. That's great. So, yeah. So tell us about your, you've done a lot of racing, you know, when you started when you're, would you say 14 years old? Yeah. Uh, 14 was, uh, was the start of it all. And uh, local racing, of course, um, got involved with that, tried to get in. They wouldn't let me in until I was 16, you know, so we had to forge some paperwork to get in there to race, but uh, we get in the race. And uh, I think the first race, as I remember, um, it was, uh, it was last place for sure. Yeah, I was really excited, you know, to go there as a kid and trying to get somebody to take me to the race, you know. So um, anyway, finally got someone to take me to the race and got to the first corner and put her in the bushes. So <laughs> it didn't start off on the maybe the, the perfect setting, that's for sure. But uh, we quickly, quickly progressed and uh, started doing, you know, moving into some local races. And then uh, I'm going to say... You know, we, we started racing the Mercury's in 75, and that's when things really took off for me. Um, I was fortunate to uh, had a sponsor at that time, Mercury's. And, uh, you know, when you're when you're a young fella, it's like, OK, how how am I going to get to ride this stuff? I, I don't have any cash. I don't have any money. And uh, I was a long, lanky kid with long hair that just wanted to go fast. And uh, anyway. Along the way, there's been a lot of people that uh, saw something, I guess, uh, let me get a hold of the handlebars. And uh, anyway, in 74, 75, trophies started coming in. We started, you know, winning some races locally. And then uh, then it was kind of like, okay, after 75, it's like, okay, um, you know, I'm, I'm moving to the top of, of our province, let's say in Nova Scotia, and uh, it's time to hit New Brunswick. And Every time I moved to a, the next province in racing, of course, the racing got better. There was more guys. It was faster. So it was kind of like a, almost like a progression, uh, you know, peewee hockey. Then you move up a league, you move up yeah. to the next level, you keep moving up. And uh, that's kind of how 
how the oval program went uh, for a lot of years. You know, we did a lot of local racing and local racing was really popular. I mean, every weekend uh, we had races, uh, you know, they were just, you know, for trophy races and that, but uh, you know, the competition is there. Some of those races I had with some of the guys, I mean, we rubbed a lot of fiberglass and I'm sure I thought we were racing for a million bucks. I think they did too. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> we, we, we had uh, lots of fun and, uh, you know, you're just trying to get better equipment all the time. So Mercury's went for me for probably uh, oh, two or three years, 74, 75, 76. We raced Mercury, 77. We started moving into, uh, I raced some Murder Cats at that point, 77. Um, another guy locally sponsored me uh, with his cats. Uh, and that that was really good. I'd go to the racetrack and, you know, I had Mercury's to race in this class and I had Arctic cats to race in the other. And, and I was just looking for anybody who had anything faster. I mean, I, I didn't have any real brand loyalty at that time. It was just, I had no money. I wanted to be a racer and I wanted to go to Eagle river and I wanted to win the world championship, you know, and I was only 16 years old. And, uh, Anyway, boy, did I ever get an awakening on that. So 20 years later before I got the Eagle River and hold first place. But uh, anyway, so we went through that deal with the Cats. And then, you know, the Cats uh, cats didn't have that much power, motor power. At that particular time, the Rotexes were, were really developing. And, uh, you know, we started putting Rotex engines in the Cats, uh, you know, and that was probably a no-no. The cat guys didn't like me. The skidoo guys didn't like me. You didn't have a real. And I was just like, I don't care. I want to win. If I had the best chassis and I had the best motor and that was kind of, I was desperate. Uh, I was a desperate guy who wanted to win races. So then finally uh, we moved into 1978 and I got an offer to drive with the Polaris team. Polaris had a local, merit. they called it Maritime Blue Express. And uh, drove with uh, the first time I was ever part of a team. So uh, Steve Lamb, Huey McDonald, and myself got Polaris RXL 340s. And, you know, that was like, oh, major. This was major. We went to the factory. We, you know, they taught us how to set the sleds up. I was just like, okay, this is my dream. You know, like I'm, I'm ready, right? I'm ready. I'm, I'm going to dominate. And I think I remember the first race that I, uh, I was on that machine. If I remember correctly, it left it left me so fast at the line. I think the machine left, and I was sitting on the ground, you know, just not prepared for this independent thing at all. You know, you, you can have all the training you want, but we had no seat time. I think we got the RXLs like you know maybe two days before the race, and uh, you know we we had to get there. I mean, that's one of the things when you're traveling a lot of distance. I mean, if you're racing on Saturday, for me. I'm mostly leaving on you know Thursday, Thursday, Fridays. You're driving two days to get to some of these bigger races, and you race two days and drive two days home. So I mean, go weekend racing is like a six day deal. I mean, it, it it costs a lot of money and time, and so for me, I needed sponsors, and the only way I could get sponsors was if I won. So it was like I either won or I crashed. It was it was just about getting to that point, you know. <laughs> I'm not saying I was the friendliest guy on the racetrack, but I knew I had to win. And uh, it was, uh, it was, it was lots of, I had a fiberglass kit with me pretty near every weekend. I mean, <laughs> oh, geez. So, it, it, was there yeah. money? Like you said, you said you want, you couldn't really afford it to, to do it. You had to win. Was there money to be won in it? Like, was it, was it good? Oh, yeah. Gig if, yeah. You're, if you're, Yeah. Yeah, we were racing for cash. When we moved into the independent stuff uh, in 78, you know, the prize money was moving up. Like you could pay for your weekend. You could pay for your motels. You could pay for your gas. I mean, I, I couldn't pay for the repairs if I smashed it. But, you yeah. know, lots, lots of weekends that, uh, you know, we actually made money, you know, not counting the, you know, the price of the sled and all that sort of stuff. So 78 was kind of my major year. You know, they got involved in, I'll say, you know, a semi-organized part of a team, you know, that kind of a thing. And that was a that was a whole new experience for me. I never raced with uh, a group of guys, right? Yeah. 
J- Jinxy boy says he thinks he might need him on his nutcracker race team. He says Paul Prudham needs a needs a whooping. There's there's a <laughs> Jinxy boy's sticker I put on my. Uh, okay. On my yeah, we got to okay. send you out one of those, right? And, I don't even think I, Jinxie Boy has these stickers yet, by the way. Maybe, maybe, that, is maybe Nut, this week. Is, is, the, is Nutcracker a race team? It's a, What's the name of the race? It's all vintage one-lungers, I think, is the rule. Oh. On it. He'll fill you okay. in. So. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, but uh, so, like, you've been in this for so long. You, you've seen snowmobile evolution and, like, from – the very beginning to what it is today. Give me some of your favorite things that you've seen. It doesn't have to be ski doo, but anything that you've seen in the industry that were like, like, like almost like the smart shocks are today, you know, like where it's like, this is a game changer, but what have you seen over the years like that? Well, for me, the biggest thing was when we, you know, went from the leaf springs to the independent front suspension. So 78, 79, 80, you know, that was just monstrous. I mean, like instead of running up against the walls on the side of the track, I mean, we had, we had bank tracks at some of the places we had. I mean, these sleds just handled so, so much better. You could just, your corner speed was so much higher. Um, it was amazing to ride them. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the single track stuff with the independent front suspensions. Obviously, the liquid-cooled engines was a big jump, you know, going from the air-cooled stuff. Um, Suspensions got better. Handling got better. The clutches got better. Like, everything improved. Um, It was – and the safety of the track started, you know, obviously had to pick up because as the speeds got higher, uh, you know, there was more accidents and there was more more people getting hurt. So you had to have more equipment on. I mean, when we initially raced, we – I'm not saying no gear, but I mean, other than a open face helmet and gloves, I mean, that was the norm in the early seventies. So, I mean, for me, I've raced, uh, this year will be 50 years every season. Uh, I don't race in the winter anymore. I race on the asphalt for the last couple of years. I guess I'm getting too old for the cold, man. But, uh, you know, we did oval racing for, uh, 20 years. We did, uh, ice drags for, uh, 20 years i did asphalt racing you know while i was doing the uh ice drag so we're probably into 15 years of asphalt racing by now so i'm i i don't know what i'd do if i uh if i didn't race you know in in the year it just it becomes part of you and uh you know i i, I guess there's a point where i'm just gonna have to have to stop and hopefully uh hopefully they'll let me continue <laughs> <laughs> When do you like that's the thing? You're still racing asphalt today, and that's that's pretty nutty. Like, are you have you always been this crazy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've always thought I was 16 in my thumb, I think, or in my head, but uh, you know, and that part has kept me very uh active. Uh, I think it was last year, yeah, last year, the year before, you know, I, I ended up buying a well, I ended up buying a sled. I don't know if you, it's called the money train. Well, the money train is a turbocharged Yamaha four cylinder state of the art world record holding sled. And, uh, I got to know the guys very well because the sled was just such a, you know, a legend sled and somewhere along the way, you know, I was dreaming one night and I made a comment to him and said, you know, man, if you guys ever sold that sled, like, you know, I, I'd be interested, right? Like I'd, I'd really be interested. Anyway, that sled obviously wasn't for sale for a lot of years. And then one day I get a call and say, hey, Gord, you know, we're, 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 we're going to sell that sled. And I'm oh, wow. He said, and I, I know you're interested and you got first dibs. And I'm thinking like, okay. He said, you got to let me know, like, if you, if you want to take it. And uh, anyway, I've been, you know, dreaming of just, I just wanted to dream of go down the track on that machine. It was just so 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 fast at the time you know and i said you know i i better i better get on this before i'm too old to squeeze this thing right you know because there'll come a time when you'll just have so much horsepower that i won't be able to hold on you know so anyway they they took it to a racetrack here miramichi new brunswick and they still race quarter mile and uh, most of these big asphalt sleds there's no more quarter mile it's way too dangerous like you know it's way too fast Uh, they race 660 now for the last 
a number of years. So I went to this quarter mile track and I just decided, you know what, this is, it's now or never. If I'm going to give this thing a squeeze, we're going to find out how fast this goes. I, anyway, short story is we made a pass and I went down the strip at 175 miles an hour. And I have never gone that fast on a snowmobile in my life. And it was just the most amazing experience. I, I, like I was just, I've never been on a snowmobile, you know, that just, I thought, okay, this is actually fast enough. Like, I don't know if I want to go any faster. And the biggest surprise wasn't actually going to 175. The biggest surprise was actually trying to slow it down. 175 miles an hour on a snowmobile, when you pick up <laughs> and behind the windscreen, that helmet comes right to your face. You don't even breathe for the first second. And then you, you can't put the brakes on. You have to just let it slow down. And I remember going by the, the drag strip. They got two openings. There's like the first opening you in for the slow cars and then the second opening for the, you know, the big rail cars and that. And I was going by the second exit and I was still going probably 80 miles an hour at the second exit. And I'm looking, I see the gravel trap. I see the, I see the woods and I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be tight. And I got it stopped like just before the gravel. And I can remember coming back and the guy told me, he said, you know how fast you went down there? And I, no idea. He said 175 miles an hour. I think it was 7.8 seconds in the quarter. And uh, come back to the trailer and, you know, a bunch of guys come over to the trailer. They were just, they couldn't believe they'd never seen a snowmobile go that fast. And this young guy come over with his father and his father said, you know, can I get a picture of the sled and you and the young fellow on that? And uh, he said, are you going to do that again? And I said, no, I, no, not, no, I won't be going. I'm not going out to do that again. I, I, that was like a great rush, but I don't think I want to push, uh, push my, my odds there too, too far. <laughs> That's crazy. That's nuts. And that, that's the thing. My sled's called the money pit. So yours actually makes you money. Is that why you call it a money train? Uh, no, no, no. That's not the reason for that name, I'm sure. I think there was a money train behind it building it. That's about, <laughs> I think that's where that, that came from. That sled's pretty famous. I think as far as I know, it's the only snowmobile that I know of that's been in the wind tunnel. Like they actually took wow. that to a wind tunnel put it in there and a, and a wind tunnel, you know, for an automobile, I, I'm going to take a stab here, 15, $20,000 an hour to go in a wind tunnel. This is not a small, uh, uh, small endeavor, but uh, the guys at Mott Motorsports there and Ken Smith, uh, they had a major team. You know, they were, a, it was just an absolute pleasure to work with them and see the technology that they had at that time. It was just, it was just awesome. That's crazy. Yeah, we have some pictures of that coming up. I've got some house cleaning to do. Hold on. There was a there was a super sticker somewhere here. Uh, where is it? But yeah, you've, uh, your your uh, racing heritage is just it's insane how how good it is. But here we go. Here, Jason Seamer. Thank you so much. And what else do we have? We have oh, off the cuff adventures with the ten dollars super chat. Hold on a second here. I got to grab that up. That puts you in the uh, that puts you in the mountain madman. Uh. You got to fill me in. What's going on here? You're, you're selling well, they, stickers? Or? No, they, they, you can donate to to the channel and to the show. And, oh, okay. Uh, these, yeah. So these people have been generous enough to to send me some stuff. The the mountain madman is ten dollars or more. Oh, that's not it. That's my, that's my, uh, hold on a second. That's my old, uh, Tug Hill, uh, sound effect here. Here we go. Oh, that's, it's coming off wrong here. My technology sucks. Here we go. <laughs> there we go. That's off the cuff. And we also had the dollar ninety nine one. one. Thank you so much guys for the donations tonight. That's pretty awesome. There's, there's, I see someone out there knowing Terry Clattenburg, so he's from the, the East Coast. So, yes, yeah. I know Terry Clattenburg very well. That's cool. That's cool. If you guys have any questions for Gord as far as clutch setup or anything like that, um, anything on old sleds, he's the guy. What do we got in your showroom there behind you? Can you 
Can you see? You're you're hiding one of these. I could see that. Uh, well, we've got an 850 turbo there. That's my ride for uh, for this winter, and uh, I've been out on that quite a bit the last two weeks. We had snow, and the trails are pristine. And uh, anyway, we uh, are really enjoying that sled. It's uh, it's really nice. Probably the nicest uh, 852 stroke that I've squeezed in a long time, right at the showroom. Um, Obviously, we we have to make it faster. <laughs> so we're gonna obviously use our friends uh, Jaws Jaws pipes. We're gonna put that on it. That's kind of number one. Jaws got a twenty horsepower boost, so now we got two hundred horsepower. We've got tuners now for it, so you know two twenty, two ten. I mean, this is some, and this is all on pump gas stuff. So I mean, sled's a nice, very very nice sled. Lots of nice power. A lot of the guys probably, you know, used to driving some of the older sleds when you squeeze them, you know, when you got to three quarters throttle, that was basically it. Like the last quarter, you pushed it, but it didn't really accelerate. And, uh, you know, with a race sled, a true race sled, you know, it it pushes all the way through. It's totally linear. And this is the first stock trail sled that I have ever ridden where the throttle response is actually from zero right to 100%, every spot you move your thumb, there's a reaction off the sled. So, I mean, you know, hats off to the engineers at Skeeto for delivering that sled in a stock form because to me that is, you know, there's there's no big turbo lag. It's very smooth. It's actually deceiving because, as you know, when you have something that's really smooth, it doesn't actually give you the sensation of a lot of power. Like if you have something with kind of like, a little bit of a miss or a, you know, or it just comes on really hard. It straightens your arms and, you know, it feels like it's a lot, you know, it's, it's like the, I always say it's like the guys, you know, that uh, they take the stock muffler off and they put the loudest can on and they think they're flying. They just, you know, just yeah. because they hear that sound. Right. So, yeah. you know, what's very deceiving about these new sleds is how quiet they actually are and, you know, how fast they actually are because, uh, you know, over the years, you know, the, they keep moving the bar. They keep moving the bar, and uh, you know, I'm 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 going to say hats off to the guys uh, in the engineering department because I think they delivered a really nice engine package, and the and the clutching is you know is decent. I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna knock that. That's really good. Um, you know, Corey and I obviously talked, and everybody's a little different, uh, a little bit little bit different driver, but. Uh, I I think for a sit down guy and you know I think a lot of us who bought the competition model that's what they are they're not jumping off you know 10 foot I mean some are but I'm just saying there's a lot of the guys that bought them are probably 50 60 years old maybe like myself 65 years old right and if you drive primarily on groomed trail um I wasn't personally that happy with the corn ring of that sled and for me, I don't like a high sled, and that sled is very high. It's very capable on bumps, you know, coming straight at you. But for me, when I the way I like to ride is I like to come into a corner and I like to lean off to the side, you know, before I before I get there. And the goal for me is always to come out of the corner faster than when I went in. And in order to do that, you got to have control and you got to have, I'll say hook up obviously through the corner and and I like a machine that says very flat. So I worked with John on this and talked to him, you know, about the setup. And I think really, you know, the the present setup with the dual stage spring on that particular machine is just perfect. Um you know that sled is like um it's gonna rough number like thirty thousand dollar sled in Canada. And, you know, I didn't want to buy that sled and, you know, spend four or 5,000 more, you know, to put shocks on it right away. I said, you know, I'd really like to see if I could come up with something where we retained the stock shocks on it, but yet lowered it down. And uh, that's what we have done. And uh, working with the guys at Accelerate Technology, um, we now got a machine. And I'll, and I'll say this, people might take it the wrong way, but. The Turbo 850 for me was a, a an off-road truck, a customized off-road truck. 
very capable, very rugged, very great in the suspension. It's a competition model. That's what it was designed for. But that's not what I like to do with it. I want a sled that's going to be lower to the ground. So we've come up with this lowering kit, and we've just kind of, I'll say, perfected it uh, to where I feel like it's going to be a real good upgrade for someone who has that turbo. And the key component is, of course, you know, taking the shocks, taking the springs off the front, replacing them with the dual rate setup. And we tried that. But really, when you take the center shock out, that's when the whole sled just totally changed. So we ended up coming back to the shop, taking the center shock out and putting the same setup that uh, John basically had in the front. Only now we're doing it in the center shock. So when you do that shorter center shock and not as much pressure, you can actually throttle on that machine in the corner with lots of control, no inside ski lift, and just come. It is like we went from an off-road truck to a Corvette, and that's what wow. I wanted when I had that turbo. It handles now like a Corvette. And everything is going to have to, you know, it depends on the guy's setup. You know, a lot of guys run a lot of studs. And when you run more studs, you're going to have to have a little more carbide. And there's no question about that. So depending on, you know, your stud setup and your weight setup. But we've got it down now where we, it's, it's very, very nice. We, uh, we took, this is just old school, old school approach. You know, I took my buddy's 850 Turbo out with me. We did all the testing with one totally stock and my sled. And we drove it on the same day, the same trail. I've got this little trail that I really like. It's got a lot of twisties, some up and down. And we rode them side by side. And we kept that machine stock. And then we modified ours with the lowering kit. And it was night and day. So I'm really, really happy, uh, you know, to tell the guys who have the turbo 850s that we now actually are going to offer a kit that's going to take your 850 turbo and actually make it a corvette and you know if you want nice handling and that's what you that's you know you're you're riding on groomed trail you don't need that, that height and for me anytime i'm up on a sled that's that high in the air i'm not comfortable and uh, that's just a personal preference there's lots of guys hey all i ride is standing up and i'm I'm going down the trail and I'm looking for the biggest bump and I want the biggest air. So for me, if I see a bump, I'm going around it. I'm not trying to go over. My days of jumping off the end of these big things is over. So it pays to tune in to uh, your podcast, see? Eh? Yeah, there you go. New product launch tonight. That's awesome. The, uh, when you lower something, though, I know with cars, you don't, yep. you don't lose your suspension travel. So you well, still have we, that, that capable sled four bumps it's just a lower center of gravity on the machine is that right well partially um what you have to do of course is the spring rate on the main spring actually has to be shorter and it has to be a little stiffer and uh so you're not really losing anything because if you really start getting aggressive in the corners the little tender spring on the top that basically maxes out we lock that out with the crossover and what we found is we can actually adjust the length of the crossover. So if you know if you're a rider that likes a little more cushiness, we can give you that. But if you're an aggressive rider and you say, "Oh, I just want a little bit for those small stutter bumps," but when I get into the corner, like I like to hammer down and still hit those bigger bumps, you can still do that. But uh, you know, I don't think a lot of us uh, who drive groomed trail necessarily need. 12 14 inches of travel like it's not really necessary like if you look at your little uh, indicator on your shocks you know i do this every time this might be this might be something the guys can do if you want to really know how much you're using but they've got these little rubber stoppers inside the shocks you pull them up before you start the ride you go down your trail it's a normal trail and then i want you to stop at the end of that trail and you take a look at your shocks and for some guys, they're using 50, 60% of that shock travel. So if you're using 50 to 60% of that shock travel, you know, you're not using that. So like give up that little bit to gain that nice ride and that nice quality. And, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. You can't, the geometry, you can't just drop a machine in the nose, you know, three inches and expect things to work. Like the, the key thing here is you have to make the adjustment with that center shock. The center shock is the magic shock 
in order to get your handling correct. And I see so many guys on the trail, you know, they're adjusting the back shocks. They'll adjust the front shocks. They will drive for 10 years and never look at that center shock. And that to me is kind of like one of those things until somebody points that out to you. And, you know, when I talked to John, he talks in very straight terms. And he said to me, he said, Gord, look, you know, the center shock, just imagine that's your teeter totter. You know, that is where everything pivots off. And the pressure that you have in that center shock is critical. And the type of spring you use, that's all super, super important. So, you know, for the guys that want to get the best out of their sled in the corners and in suspension, I'm going to say, and if you haven't looked at the center shock, you know, area, that's that's something that, you know, I'll say is that next level again, right? That's that's where you, you need to go, especially if you're going to start lowering the sled. Has that train of thought changed over the years, though? Because back in the day, they said they used to say, take that center shock and loosen it off so the spring just doesn't rattle. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you, you, you can get into some danger there, too, because if you got no pressure on the shock, and I've seen this happen, I've, I've, I've made the mistake, you know, where you'll actually, the collar will drop off the bottom of the spring. So that's really dangerous. Uh, you can, you know, you can lock up a lot of, you can do a lot of damage there. So you can't just take a full size spring and just back all the pressure off the nut. That's not the correct way to do it. You actually, you know, you must have a shorter spring to begin with so that you can get match what you did on the front. I got you. So that yeah. you're, you're saying that whatever you do on the front, you have to do to that center spring. Well, this is my, this is me, and uh, you know, I, the, for the way I ride and for what I want to do with the sled, th that that's the way I want to ride. So uh, you know, I'm I'm hoping, you know, I'm 180 pounds, and uh, you know, if you're if you're in that kind of body weight, that package that I've got on my sled right now, you'll get on that, and you'll be like, oh wow, I had no idea that this sled could handle that well. And you'll notice it if you ride the sled hard and where you notice it is from the midway point of the corner and coming out. As soon as you start squeezing the throttle on to go faster, you know, the inside ski lifts and it pulls you over. And that is when you don't have the control. And that is what I absolutely, I mean, the only thing I probably hate worse than a high sled is a heavy sled. So, I mean, you, you get a sled that's, you know, you can't go to the Daytona 500 with a van, right? <laughs> no, that's right. Well, you, if you want to go around a corner, you you got to get this. You got to get down. And low is there's so much height there. You know you can give up two three inches on that top. And uh, like I say, that little test with your shock absorbers and you start looking at what you're using. I think it'll probably tell you. You know, really, you know, are you a good candidate for that or not on the trail, right? Absolutely. David Brennan, he brings up a point. He says he likes to rebuild his shocks often. How often would you say uh, you should rebuild your shocks or look at your shocks? Well, um, for it, it, it depends, I suppose. It, some people say it's mileage, right? And, of course, the more you ride, obviously, you should look at them. But the max, very max, max, max for me is two seasons. And, you know, if you can do them once a year, you're going to have better ride quality for sure. Um, you know, the oil breaks down like anything. It, I, I, I don't know what it is about shocks, but it's almost like people are scared to touch them or they, you know, unless it's leaking or unless it's, you know, the bottom the out or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Nobody kind of, nobody kind of likes to work on them. But I mean, the reality is we've got some incredible talent in Canada, you know, that can do shock repair. And, you know, shocks are at such a great level now compared to what they were. But it's like anything. I mean, just because you, you, got, you bought the top of the line shock, you know, you can't drive on that for five years and not do any maintenance to it. Uh, otherwise, you're, you know, you're just wasting your, your money. Yeah, there you go. Uh, David said he likes to do it in the spring, and that way it's not sitting uh, all summer uh, in the old oil. Is that is that a good tip? Yeah, yeah. There's... Uh, like, no, no question. I mean, you know, it's the same with the four stroke guys. I mean, obviously, at the end of the season, that is the best time to change the oil in the engine as well. Like, don't let it sit. Like a lot of guys, they just put them away and then they change the oil at the start of next year. And it's the same price to change it, you know, now or then. 
So for me, it's like, okay, season's done. We're going to change the oil in the filter in that four stroke. So then it's put away all summer with no condensation. You know, it, 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 it's, it's just smart uh, in my mind to change the oil at the front half of that season, right? Oh, absolutely. So what else have you got sitting back there? You've got a little uh, uh, MXZ120. Is that what that is? And then oh, what's the little uh, vintage yeah. thing there? Yeah, we got one of the little mini Zs, you know, for the grandkids. Uh, we got some uh, trails around the house here, and uh, I I got to get that next generation going soon. I don't know if I can last. <laughs> <laughs> well, you so, could probably you could probably fit the Comp 850 Turbo R in that thing. There might be room under the hood, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that's why I haven't gotten it. I haven't gotten the go ahead from my wife modifying kid stuff yet. <laughs> it could be short lived. That's right. And what's the what's the vintage one with the orange and white hood there beside it? Uh, that is my seventy three four forty Blizzard. And nice. uh, when I was a young fella, um, you know, in seventy three when I started racing, um, I went to the you know the biggest race we had back then and. Uh, Guys came with blizzards. I never saw a blizzard in my life. And I always remember the orange hood and the open pipes. Like there was no such thing as those open pipes. And man, as a 14-year-old or 15-year-old, that blizzard was just like, you know, looking at a Corvette, you know, like how would I ever get my hands on one of those? Who would ever let me squeeze the throttle of that, you know? So it was, it was years and years later, and I, I just said, you know, that was a machine that was pivotal for me. You know, it's kind of like the goal. You know, I wanted to, by the time I got to where I could get one of those, uh, it was it was long gone. It was it was obsolete. The free airs were over. And anyway, now I look at it just with like, yeah, I remember that point, you know. So 73, 73 orange blizzards for me. Uh, yeah, I got a weakness for those. <laughs> that's awesome. No, that's good. And is that the money train sitting out front there with the lime green on it? No, that no, that's a that's another sled. That's a pro line with a pro mod. Uh, that's my asphalt sled. So anyway, that's what we're 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 working on in the garage. We do a little vintage, and then we do a little race stuff, and then we do some trail stuff. And uh, anyway, it's uh, it's great. I mean, I'm 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 so blessed, uh, you know, that I get every day to work on snowmobiles because for me, it's, it's not really work. It's just, I just so happy to wrench on them or try to improve them or try to figure something out. Or that's kind of my, that's kind of my, <laughs> my dream, I guess. So I'm living my dream. <laughs> Actually, LaPointe wants in on your dream. He says, I wish Gord was my grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Mass Art says adoption, question mark. Yeah, yeah. Get in line, Mass Art. Get in line. We're, we're open for sponsorships for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> he, he missed the part about the money train, you know. You're, you're sled poor, you know. Yeah. How many snowmobiles yeah. do you own? Is that the collection or do you have some hidden that uh... – uh, <laughs> That's – there's there's a lot – there's a – yeah, there's – there, there's there's a lot more yeah the uh, there's, greg there's, kelly has I, the right idea he says, greg kelly has the right idea just to get to use the shop that's what i'd love <laughs> you know yeah. as i freeze as i freeze my fingers off out working in my shop <laughs> yeah well you know when i was a young fellow that was um, a garage was an incredible dream and i i i just couldn't imagine like having a garage and uh, it took me a long time to get to the point where I could have a, have a garage that I really, you know, was really happy in, let's say. And yeah, uh, yeah. I, think, I think you need to really, really taste the, the sour to enjoy the sweet. And I, I had a lot of frostbitten fingers and do anything to wrench and outside. I mean, there was, there was none of that luxuries of uh, today's race teams. There's no question, but, it's uh it's a different world, right? Yeah. Who do you who do you like when you say you don't fix sleds, like you, you prefer them to come to you running and you just make them faster? 
Um, is it race teams that are coming to you or is it Joe Blow like Corey that wants to, to just, you know, make his sled as, as, as best as possible? So primarily we do a lot of work for, I'll say racing customers that, that are, that, you know, are racing competitive on a series somewhere that are looking for an edge. And then we have, I'll say, you know, a, a large group of trail guys, uh, you know, that just want to beat their buddy down the lake because we, we got to be realistic. I, I think when we talk about racing, I mean, the, you know, it's, it's definitely like, you know, just cut a big hole in the center of the hood and just start sticking in hundred dollar bills. And you tell me when you want to stop. And, uh, that's, that's how fast you're going to go because it is definitely related to cash in versus speedometer up. And everybody's got a budget. So, you know, a guy comes in to me and he says, Hey, Gord, you know, I've been out in the lake and, uh, you know, buddy on the turbo 850 there, he's just inching by me, you know, every time I got to listen to him. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I just would just like to go out there just once and just, you know, drill him on the lake. So it's nothing but a personal grudge, but you know what? That's real important for that customer. And, uh, to me, I just kind of just be straight up. Okay, you know, how much faster do you think you need to go? And I let the customer tell me. He says, I need five miles an hour. And then I tell him five miles an hour, depending on the sled, whatever, it's going to be this much money for five miles an hour. And, you know, you got to decide. Do you want to spend that money? And then I have other customers that say to me, I don't care what the cost is, Gord. <laughs> I want to have the fastest sled in this section of town or whatever. And, you know, for that customer, he, he has the resources and you, that's a great challenge too, because, you know, the guy's giving you an open checkbook and he wants a result. And if I don't deliver the result, I'm not going to be selling to him again. And happy customers are what makes Gord's garage go round. <laughs> I learned yeah, that great. quickly. <laughs> I was, a uh, I was a Skeeto dealer for 36 years. And uh, we ran a store with, you know, 12 employees, 10, 12 employees. Uh, we were a platinum dealer at the time when platinum first came out. And I was very proud of, you know, our, our score and uh, looking after customers. And, you know, their, their challenge that, that I find is that as the business grows and you have more people to look after, it's very difficult unless you add staff to give them that quality that you can as a small shop. And I suppose the Gord's Garage thing for me is really unique because I can give red carpet treatment right now. It's only, it's only me and mm -hmm. I've got a select number of people. And you know, if it's, a, I turn away lots of work. Uh, I, I do because I'm, I'm not interested in, I'm not a repair guy. There, we have a, you know, like a great skidoo dealer in town. And he can look after that. We've got capable people for repairs. I did that. I don't want that. And uh, anyway, so the where we are now, and it looks like heading, you know, with uh, with with the product. We come out with that mounting bracket kit, you know, to put your put the link bag on the back of your 850 turbo. We come out with that, uh, you know, probably a month ago, and that's just taken off like wildfire. Like I mean. You know, lots of guys wanted to carry a bag on the back there. And uh, anyway, so the bracket thing, we're selling them all over U.S. and Canada right now. It's online. And, you know, go to our website, Gord's Garage Limited, and you can click on buy your little bracket. I'm putting <laughs> – if you click on, it comes up on my phone. I go put a bracket kit together. We mail it out to you. And uh, those guys have been, you know, really the first guys – for us in the in the online business, I guess I never ever had that before. So it's kind of a cool way of doing business. Uh, for me, they're not physically in the garage, but after they buy the product, a lot of them reach out to me and say, "Hey, you know, I got the bracket. I'm really happy with that. Uh, what else you got for that 850 turbo?" You know. So sometimes those conversations lead to things, and uh, you know, it was a conversation that I had with one of the customers. You know, and I asked him, I said, did you drive your machine yet? No, I haven't. And I said, okay, well, we got snow and I've been driving mine. And I said, I don't find it corners that well. And uh, anyway, two days later, he calls me back up. Hey, we got snow. I was open my sled. Man, that sled doesn't corner that well. And he goes, you know, you got a fix for that? 
And I, well, I'm working on it. And he said, okay, I, 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 I want to buy the first one you got. And uh, that's kind of the way it's been going. So, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to do my best to, to I'll say, do that red carpet uh, service. And it takes time. And, uh, but at the same time, it's real rewarding. Cause I mean, if you ship something out to somebody and then he calls you up and, you know, he has a problem or he has, you know, a unique thing that he didn't tell me, like he's got, you know, 192, 1.65 inch studs in it, you know, it changes things. And, uh, one thing with snowmobiles and snowmobilers, it's a very personal thing. You know, what's right for one snowmobiler it's not it's it's not like a one size fits all program. Everybody's of a different skill set, and uh, usually, <laughs> I, I, I hate to say this, but I think it's true. Uh, you know, most of us overrate our skills. So when I ask someone, you know, what kind of a driver they are or how do they drive, you know, uh, it, it, the the more accurate description they can give to me of what they really do on their sled, I can really help them come up with the right setup. Uh, for them. And, you know, it might not be what I'd sell their buddy, but his buddy drives a totally, you know, different style, different area. He really likes the jumps. He's a stand up guy. You know, he's got massive forearms, <laughs> big steroid type deal, you know, and a lot of guys are a little more into finesse and uh, that kind of stuff. So um, it's been a, it, it's been great uh, because I get to talk to a lot of people all over U S and Canada and, uh, you know, the more you talk to people, um, there's lots of great ideas out there. And uh, one thing kind of, you know, it kind of leads to another. Um, you know, I, I also did a thing last year for my wife, which is, um, I think, was probably the best thing I've ever done in snowmobiling, is I actually converted her sled, you know, for a, a lighter rider. Like she's, uh, you know, a li lighter weight. And uh, we'd go out riding and, uh, you know, she'd always be complaining, you know, the trails are rough and whatever. And I started noticing on the sled, like when she gets on the sled, the, the sled doesn't even move. Like it, it, there's, it doesn't go, it doesn't move one inch, you know. And uh, I started thinking about that. And I said, you know, I spend all this time setting up race sleds for guys and all this. And here's my wife on the trail. And uh, anyway, so I started last year and I totally change that machine like totally set it up for her uh we put some accessories on it that, uh, that i'm going to say you know or for for people with smaller hands so we've, we've got it you know skidoo has been very upfront and moving ahead in the right direction for the women riders and lighter riders they come out with a set of smaller diameter handlebars a throttle lever that's you know 20 25 percent less pressure for your thumb and a brake lever now that's adjustable so we geared that all up on her sled, you know, made it kind of customized. And I did that last year. And, uh, you know, when we rode on the trail, and if I let another lady drive my wife's sled, now I'm getting the comment from her that I've been getting from the guys. It's like, oh, can you do that to my sled? My sled rides like a truck, you know? And it's, and I started thinking about that. It's not a, you know, I know that, I know this business is probably 90% male, I guess, probably. And But for the ladies that are out there driving, I kind of thought I, I would actually do a little program, you know, for lighter riders, something that's going to be easier for their hands, you know, easier on the suspension. They, You know, anyway, that was a, a I, I went down a path that uh, kind of led me to some other things. And because, uh, you know, I think the common thing that, you know, most of us probably see in suspension setup is the guys are heavy and the big guys are always complaining. Their suspension's bottoming out and you got to buy the, oh, I need the big boy springs. I need the heavy duty this. I need the heavy duty that. Right. And those guys have got all kinds of options, but the riders that are less than 150 pounds, they don't have a whole lot of people that are, I'm going to say, catering to them. So I was trying to kind of have a little you know a little market there for some lady riders and I, I think that's a whole other branch that Gord's Garage could could definitely go down the road in. Yeah I think that's an untapped market for the the female riders and it's kind of neat that you're not just about to slam it to the ground and make her make her corner fast. If if someone wants a big bump 
performance, you've got that ability to do that or to soften everything up. That's really cool. Build it for the rider, you know? Yep. Very neat. Hey, do you want to have a look at some fan photos? And we'll have a look at some of those things that you talked about as far as ride height goes, your your uh, your link bag uh, attachment for the, the ice jug. Um, you want to get into that? Pictures? Yeah, for sure. Let's do that. I'm just going to roll my fast track uh, sponsor and then uh, we'll get right into it. All right. You're doing really well today, by the way. It's uh, been a really fun show. <laughs> now we have sound, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Here, I'll get right into this, okay? Yeah. Fan photos are brought to you by Fast Track Snowmobile Traction. This season, quit sliding sideways on the ice and losing races to your buddies. A Fast Track stud kit will help you with improved braking and give you the arm-ripping acceleration you crave. I put over 3,000 clicks last season on my Renegade 850, and I'll tell you, these studs exceeded my expectations. Not one broken stud, my Ida wheels still look like new, and they hooked up like I was on rails in the twisties, inspiring confidence every ride. Fast Track Top Gun kits are the highest rated stud kit at 4.9 stars with over 230 reviews. The studs are heat treated stainless, so they are strong and they don't rust. The kit is lighter, easier on the track, and has a lifetime warranty against braking. Each kit comes with a track-specific template for complete balance with over double the scratch lines from stock templates. All listeners, when purchasing a stud kit, can get a free install kit, a $30 value. Visit FastTrack.co, add both products to the cart, and use the coupon code SNOW at the checkout. That's F-A-S-T-T-R-A-C dot C-O. There we go. And that's what I was up to uh, lately is uh, we've got both sleds studded. We've got the 2018 in the background there. Uh, it's got a 1.35 Cobra on it that we put uh, some of the Top Gun single ply studs in and then uh, just did the, uh, the, the 850 Renegade XRS or MXZ 137 uh, with them. And uh, they look dynamite. So can't wait to get that. I wanted to get ready. We got some snow coming in. So I, I wanted to be ready in case I can actually get out on it tomorrow or tomorrow night. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> Still a lot of work to do in the shop yet, but uh, we'll we'll get there. You know. What's your uh, what's your opinion, studs or pre-studded? What what's your thoughts on tracks there, Gordon? Well, uh, obviously, from the racing side, it's always you know not not pre-studded, but I think the pre-studded has definitely got a place on the trail, you know, for that customer. Um, especially what I find the guys who just you know they've they've lost a heat exchanger, they had a stud rip out, the stud went through the heat exchanger, ruined their trip, they you know towed the out on a rope, and for those guys, you know, the pre-studded track, it gives you you know I'm going to say considerable grip more than a non-studded track you know it doesn't offer what the uh, i'll call the old-fashioned studs do that's for sure but you're not carrying the extra weight i i, I think there's definitely a spot for the pre-studded i'm seeing more and more guys order the option with the pre-studded track so um i think we're going to see more of that we don't seem to have the stud pull outs that they had you know in the early stages with that it's uh it's come a long way yeah, for sure. Like that's the thing. Like the the studs, uh, some of them have shoulders on, so the nut doesn't go all the way down, so it doesn't really grip the track as tight. But these don't, and uh, they're they've got a lifetime warranty on them, so they don't they don't uh, they don't bend or break. They stand behind them if they if you ever did have it, um, and uh, they hook up. I love it. It's uh, definitely something I've always done. I ran an ice ripper once, and it was shortly after that I threw studs in it because I just couldn't it. I just didn't like it. Didn't like that you yeah, couldn't yeah. pop. Especially if you're on the lake, right? If you're on a lake, I mean, the old-fashioned studs, there's, there's there's no substitute for that. There's no question. No, for sure. For sure. So we have uh, Chris Watson sent me in some stuff. Let me see if I can find the, uh, the script on this. Where are we here? Pretty rusty today coming back in from holidays, you know. He says, <laughs> hey, Gary. <laughs> 
He says, hey, Gary and the gang, first of all, I want to wish you all the best in 2024. It's a slow start up, start up here in cottage country, but there is signs of life. If you look hard enough, you'll see a few snow chasers out there. So we tested out our Cardos today, and we weren't impressed with the distance stated by Cardo. They say that they can communicate up to 1.7K on the lake. It worked up to 600 meters, but on the trail, it was good for 500 meters. As soon as you get into the twists and turns, it becomes very limited. Any Cardos out there using users out there getting better results? Um, by the way, we're off the Devil's Mountain at the end of the month. Chris Watson, he's from La Croix, Deep Lake Snow Chasers. And he sent us a couple of pictures here to have a look at. Um, that's a nice little grand touring there with all the complete kit on it. You know, there's a market that's getting bigger and bigger is the grand touring and the expedition type markets, right? They're doing some pretty wicked things with those sleds. And uh, there they are, must be looking over a trail sled here. Looks like they got quite a bit of snow if this was recent. If this was just taken, there's a lot of white stuff here. Do you get do you run with any accessories like the big link box that we seen in that last picture here, the one right here? That's uh no, that's not me. <laughs> no. You like to keep it as light as possible. Yeah, I'm not a I'm not a two-up guy or a link box guy. <laughs> yeah. Do you get do you get an opportunity to ride trails through the year like where you are? Yes. Yeah. yeah. How many how many miles do you do a season typically? Uh, last season was my high point. I think we did fifty two hundred kilometers, and uh, that was you know on an average season for me it's usually thirty five hundred range usually in there. But last year was uh, I went on a couple of trips. We did the Gas Bay for three or four days, then we did Quebec for five or six. So a lot of extra miles last year. Yeah, nice. There's a trail that's ready to open soon, I think. They haven't even had a groomer pass down at once yet. That's uh, that's a Quebec uh, Club St. Donat, it says on the sign. Have you ridden uh, outside of your province? Yeah. 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 Where, where do New you Brunswick. like riding? Uh, New Brunswick is the closest for us in the Bathurst area. The trails are, you know, really nice shape up there. they got a great trail network. Uh, so we do Bathurst uh, area, then we do Gaspé, which is not that much further actually for us. And then, of course, you know, I'll say a, the big trip will be the Quebec trip for us. You know, Quebec is probably about a, you know, 15, 14 hour drive for us. Like I'm, I'm on the far end of Nova Scotia. So, uh, right. I should have been a truck driver, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> where, where do you go in Quebec? Um, mostly around the Quebec City area and north of that. We were in Mount Vilaine uh, last year. That was a real experience for me. I, I really enjoyed that. They had a lot of snow up there and uh, great network. Uh, yeah, so uh, that was uh, – we, uh, we had a guide with us, and uh, that, that was a, it was a real great trip. I never did that before like we – just went from basically motel to motel. Every night we had a different spot booked and you know, you, you had to do 300, you know, depending 250, 300 miles to get to that next motel. So you had to carry, you know, the gear with you and uh, wake up in the morning and get back on the sled and go. And I had never done that uh, before. That was a real, that was a real great experience. And uh, you know, I can certainly see after doing that ride, why the four strokes are so popular in Quebec, you know, like just the amount of oil that, you know, we had to carry with us, uh, you know, for the two strokes, uh, you know, and, and I, I spoke to the guide who had with, took us on tour and he was riding a four stroke. And uh, he said to me, he said, look, for all the gear that we have to carry, you know, we just don't want to have to carry that extra oil. And uh, yeah, we know the two strokes are lighter, but uh, hey, Turbo four strokes definitely on these longer mileage things. I I I certainly can see why they're going to become the, you know the the weapon of choice for the 
for a lot of guys out there that want to do the big miles. I mean, there's no question. I mean, there, there's a spot for them on the trail. And I think there's going to be always a spot for the two-stroke guys. I'm, I, I got a soft spot for two-strokes. There's, I mean, I got lots of turbocharged stuff in the garage. Don't get me wrong. I got 750 horsepower sitting over there. I got 500 sitting on another sled. That's all great. But, I mean, I do like lightweight. And if I can get a lightweight two-stroke for trail driving, oh, I'm, I'm a pretty happy guy. <laughs> Yeah, oh, for sure. What are you thinking about the ice? Are you gonna? Are you worried about how much ice you're gonna use in that that new one? Or no, uh, that, that's that's something that's really. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm gonna say it's totally controlled by the driver. So I mean, you could go out and trail on that machine. You know, like six thousand RPM on that machine is almost a hundred kilometers an hour. So, you know, yeah. if you want to go trailing and your most of the trail speed around here is 60 to 90 kilometers an hour, you know, for a lot of people, if they're out with their wife or they're taking a leisurely tour. So, I mean, you could go out there and put a couple of hundred kilometers in that turbo and come back and not use a drop. Now, you can go out there and drain that tank if you want to hammer down, you know, so it's. For some guys, yeah, I, you know, if they're going to ride really, really fast or have the throttle deep into it, uh, you're going to use some ice. There's, there's, there's no question about that. But that tank that's on there, I think they kind of decided on that size because, you know, the habits of most of the riders. And, you know, it's uh, I, I guess we'll have to have to see on that. Um, I, I have heard that, you know, while you're breaking it in. That uh, you know, if you did a if you did a proper break in, I think three tanks is what they're saying from uh, BRP on that particular engine. And you know, I, I guess when you hear guys are using you know two and three tanks of ice and they haven't broke the machine in yet, I I I I, I don't know. To, to me, that just kind of I know there's guys. Look, I bought it, I paid for it, and I'm giving it to her right off the get go. I'm not against those guys, but I'm just saying you're going to swallow some ice, <laughs> you know. Yeah. If that's if that's the way it's going to start, and I think as the machines are starting to break in, I'm not hearing as much right now about how much ice that you know they're going through. But if you start using that machine hard right off the start, I, I think you're going to see that you know. It's, it's going to use some of that fluid. There's no question. And, well, the uh, thing is, it will it will run without ice as well. It just runs it at the standard tune, right? Like it's. Uh, well, yeah, and I mean, let's face it. Last year, um, you know, if you said you were going for, you know, a two week trip on your 850, uh, you had no trouble doing that. You know, no, so no. I mean, if if you ran out of ice. Uh, it's it's not it's not going to be the end of the world for for the trail guy, okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the way I, that's the way I look at it. I mean, uh, you know, I, I know there's some there's some guys there that kind of it's like a it's a, they're wearing it like a badge. Hey, you know, I can go through three gallons of ice in uh, two hundred kilometers. You know, <laughs> it's possible, I guess. You know, but uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. for most of us, it wouldn't be that large an issue. No, that's right. That's a Rob, the oil guy. He says it best. We can fix that oil problem with the uh, AMS oil and ship right to your hotel for the next day. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Very like true. That. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. Don't even carry it. Just, just buzz me and I'll hook you up. You know, uh, Jacob Massar, where did my thing go here? He said, let the vintage rent wrenching happen. He just got the 370 opposing running this weekend after it lost all compression last season. And they had a good weekend of wrenching on some other vintage sleds. Big storm coming our way. So next week should be some sleds on snow. That's awesome. Yeah, look at that engine. Yeah. We've come a long what way. You know? <laughs> yeah, what do you know? What do you know about that one? You must have some some experience no, on that. No, no, not not on not on that one. That one, uh, I think I only sat on that once, and I'm I can remember. I think I got a major shock on my knee touching that spark plug. <laughs> it's not your scarf going in the carburetor you worry about on <laughs> yeah. that one. It's in your those, knee getting shocked. That's 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 a beautiful that's a that's a beautiful project for sure for Jacob. Yeah, he's a good guy. He knows what he's doing under the hood. That's for sure. Yeah, looks good too. Yeah. 
Yeah. He's got a collection like yours. He's got a little mini Z back there. Just hey, like there yours. You go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I see two mini Zs there. Maybe one's not his there, but and he's got a 670 MXZ in the back. And then I don't know what he's working on there. Looks like, oh, that's that. It's a four, it's a 470 Skidoo MX that he's got oh, yeah. right there. Yeah. Yeah. So he's a, he's good. Got a lot of neat projects. And then Wisco, he sent in too. He's, uh, he said, let the, uh, what is, oh, Wisco said that. Um, nope. I don't know what Wisco said, but that that's his Panther and his new puppy on there. They're just waiting for patiently for snow. I think he said he was out ripping that 399 this, uh, this well, week. That, 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 that Panther has seen some very well cared, very well cared for. Yeah. He's actually got the, the ski boost for it too, whatever they called them. The, okay. the, the, cat the, cutter? The, kit, the cat cutter. That's it. <laughs> I was going <laughs> to, I got some knowledge on there to cats, you know, I, I was going to say something like kitty wagon, but I knew it was wrong. <laughs> I don't think it was called that, but I, I might be wrong. I might get canceled if I said what I was going to call it, but cat cutter works good. That's what it yeah. is. He's got a cat, a matching cat cutter, which is pretty sweet. Yeah, I bet you he's going to tell you what it's called. <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunate he's he rides Polaris, but his wife's smart enough to ride a Skidoo, so oh. we'll just leave we'll just leave it at that, right? Yeah. So now it's now we got your some of your pictures up here. Here's that money train that we're looking at. Oh yeah. Did you say that's that was based little... on a that's based on the Sidewinder engine? Is that what's in it? Yeah, that's a four cylinder. It started out not the three cylinder, the four cylinder, so the apex. Oh, okay, right on. Oh, it's yeah. that fast. Wow. Yeah. And that, if you can see in the picture there, it's the only sled that I know of. The turbo is behind the driver. The turbo yeah. is in the back. Yeah. That's and, you know, I've, I've I had so many guys tell me this. You know, they said, hey, you know, you got to have the turbo as close to the engine as you can possibly make it. And, uh, you know, when the money train came out, that was revolutionary to put the turbo, you know, behind the driver. Well, like maybe in theory, you know, it's better to have the turbo close to the engine, but I, I can tell you it's not hurting the money train having the turbo sitting behind the driver. Well, that's the thing. I know Skidoo makes a really short throw on the, you know, the, the tube yep. between the turbo and the intake. Everybody tries to get that turbo as close to the engine as possible. And that, yeah. you know, that, that is correct. So that money train is a, <clears throat> very unique having that turbo in the rear. It looks so cool. Is a turbo like, uh, is it is it a sled turbo or is it a, off of a car? It would be definitely off a very large car. Yeah, <laughs> it's not it's not conventional. Most of the car guys come over and say, "Man, that turbo is larger than I got on my car." That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. So four, it's a four cylinder apex basically. So that's the the eleven hundred. Well, that's that's what it started out as. Okay, like okay. there's. I mean, there's nothing original on that sled. <laughs> nothing original. Everything's been modified. Um, you know, it, it, I don't. I don't. I didn't send you a picture with the hood off, but it's a. Uh, it's substantial. Like the engine won't even start with an electric starter that's on everybody. You have to come at it with a, you know, two great big 12 volt batteries. It's 20 volt, four volt gun. To actually yeah. turn that thing over, it's 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 a monster. There's no question about it. That's wicked. And what was that? You said 175 mile an hour. I've been yeah, that was the fast there. Yeah, yeah, that was in Mare Machine in Brunswick uh, two years ago. That's wild. That's the that's fastest nuts. I've ever. That's the fastest I've ever. I haven't been in a car going 175 miles an hour. Yeah. Well, what, that, what, uh, Hurricane Dave. What's his? Is his 200 his record? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hurricane has gone really fast. Uh, I don't know what distance those guys go on the ice, but those guys get really cooking. But other guys, I, I haven't heard much over 160, you know, 150, 160. Well, 160, you got to remember, though, you got to take that with a grain of salt. The 160s that you're hearing right now are being done in 660 feet. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Okay, like they pulled that distance back because it was getting mighty dangerous, right? Like the. Yeah tracks from camoplast that they make for these asphalt machines they have been tested i believe to 180 miles an hour like 
after 180 miles an hour, the, the track could come off. It could come apart. You know, there's a, there's limits with everything, right? And if the yeah, track yeah. ever came off, you know, at 175 or 180, it, you can imagine it would never ever stop, right? No, no. So, uh, yeah, after that, uh, after that run that we made at 175, we have since put a parachute on that machine because you know. I had never tried a quarter mile. I had only ever raced it in the 660. So I really didn't know how fast it would go in a quarter mile race, but that was what the race was. It was a quarter mile and I, I did try it, but uh, looking back at that, it, it wasn't, it wasn't maybe the wisest thing in the world for me to do. Man. Well, that's the thing. You're, your brakes, what are how are they modified? Like they, you can't be running stock brakes in that thing. No, and the you brakes said are you modified and the brake pads are done differently as well. Um, because you're and you can't really use a whole lot of brake when you're asphalt racing. You have to let it calm down. Like, you know, you're going 160 and you know, you let it come down to 130. Like even at 130, you can't start you, you just you can't lock the track up. You can't put a whole lot of brake on it. So that makes it takes sense. a certain amount of time to slow down. That makes sense. Yeah, because if you yeah. actually got on the brake, you'd skid in that seat. Oh, oh, yeah. Like it's just like uh, the only way I could describe it would be when I crossed the finish line, it was like I was on marbles. The sled would want to go like right or left. And it's kind of like you want it to slow down, you know, because there's a, there's, there's obviously a, a certain amount you've got to slow down. But uh, yeah. You know, when you're when you don't have the proper shutdown, I, I, it's certainly they made the right decision racing 660 with those outlaw machines. Racing quarter mile on an outlaw sled is, you know, it's a death sentence. There's no question. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's insane. No, that's cool. And then here we are. We're looking. This is a stock bumper height of the uh, of the comp. Correct. Yep. yep. So we're at we're at 21 inches or just about 21 inches. Yeah, that's Looks sitting like on the garage floor with the carbides off. Yeah, and did you lift up on the bumper and let it drop, no, or is that just so if you pull up on the sled, it'll go higher than that? And so we pushed it down just to kind of you know give it like that. I'll say that neutral stance because you know you don't want to yank it all the way up because you don't drive it like that. You know, there's a certain no. amount of sag that's in it. So when you give it a little push once or twice down, and and it kind of settles out 21 inches. You know, to the top of the bumper is about is about where it goes. You know, you might, you know, if you do it on the floor and you got carbides on, it can't really react that well. You know, you might get 20 and a half or, you know, 21. It varies a little bit between, but that's what a stock uh, bumper height is uh, when you get the machine out of the box. I got you. Then we go to the next one and you've got it dropped to about 18 and a half. So it's uh, about two inches less than, than stock. Yeah. And then when you do the center shock, you're going to go down another half inch. So you'll get probably two and a half inches. Okay. I already yeah. see your A-arms flattening out there, which is actually the key for, you know, a flat. That's corner. right. I can't nice. see where, where the where it is, but does that picture show the angle finder on the upper arm there? Uh, no, I don't see it. Okay. I didn't say that picture. No, I don't know. I, no, so I if, have... if you put an angle finder on your upper arm on a stock machine, it's going to show you. 10 11 degrees okay on your upper arm and after you put the lowering kit in it's going to sit at you know probably three to three and a half degrees it's much 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 flatter nice nice and is there any thought of ever increasing the height of the spindle to give you more flat upper air a arm or is it better just to deal with it through the shocks well you know from an engineering point of view i think you know the engineers they had to make a decision and this is a competition package. So for the guy who rides that the way it was designed for what they did is correct. And I think really, if we're being totally honest here, most of the guys who bought a competition are going to run it as a trail sled. And that's, that's the problem. You know, you're like, you're not going to take your station wagon to the oval races, right? Yeah, that's and, right. Uh, that's right. Yeah. And, and it's just, it's just the application. My guess, you know, certainly would be, you know, that Skidoo will, you know, for next year, come out and offer a sled with the turbo 
you know, that's going to be lowered down that maybe wouldn't have that ride height as a competition model. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe even smart jocks, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, that, that would be just my, my guess because uh, I would say they're going to expand. This 850 Turbo so far has been working very well. Um, I think I think you'll see that offering expand. It would be my guess. Yeah, nice, nice. Yeah. That, what are your thoughts on Smart Shocks? Is, is that something you'd think would be an improvement on this chassis? Well, that's a that's a that's a great question. Uh, um, you know, I've ridden a lot of sleds with the Smart Shocks, and you know, from a from a tech point of view they are you know a huge advancement in suspension technology um are they perfect N not yet but uh you know they're, they're becoming more refined like anything as you know they're introduced but for a guy to get off i'll say a normal you know gas shock sled and he jumps on to a smart shock sled i mean he's gonna really enjoy that i mean you know that that ability to change the suspension settings very quickly i mean when you're when you have a computer that's actually monitoring with all those sensors you know i'll say normal joe blow you know he he can't make those adjustments that often um from a from a racing point of view you know i don't see the smart shocks as being where we would go because we want to have we want to have it in a smaller window and if you're you know if you're if you're racing, you want shocks that are going to be stiffer and lower. And if you're looking for something, I'll say trail wise, you're going to want something that's got a little bit more travel. And you, but you don't want it so firm that you're going to feel every little bump because at the end of the day, you get arm fatigue, you get worn out, your neck gets sore, your helmet's always moving around. You know that's one of the things that people don't realize when you come home on your sled and if you're you know like oh i can't ride the next day that means you probably need some help in the setup you know or or go to the gym okay like i mean yeah, comes away yeah. and say, hey well you know he can't ride the next day because you know he, he doesn't ride that often well that's true i mean guys who ride more they don't get as sore they get you know your muscles get used to it there's no question about that but if you have a machine that's properly set up for you it's not going to wear your body down. Uh, like what I find is you'll find yourself driving longer. So instead of, you know, driving maybe uh, 200 kilometers and, you know, saying, okay, I've had enough, you know, you, you, you notice that, you know, you're putting 250 or 300 on or more than that. And I, and I think if you're enjoying yourself and you're having a good time, you hate to have to kind of give it up because, oh, my thumb is sore or my knee, you know, like the knee seems to be a thing that affects a lot of us older riders, you know, Whereas maybe a set of knee pads, you know, padded pants, maybe a knee brace, you know, um, you know, as as we get older, I mean, just like we talked about the shocks, I mean, it needs maintenance. Well, our, our bodies need a little of, of that too, right? So if we don't yeah. have the body that we had when we were 30 years old, you know, we're going to need better equipment if we want to extend our, our, our lifespan on trail riding. <laughs> exactly so and this kit launched tonight is this the kit that we're looking at right here yes uh, so what is the kit and how do you order it okay so we're going to have this online probably in the next uh 48 hours 24 48 hours we're taking pre-orders on them because obviously you know it's not like having the bracket where you know you got 50 or 100 of them on standby we we don't have those resources to have that many. So it's going to basically be for the guys who come first to the plate. We're going to get their stuff ordered, locked in. We're hoping to deliver the kits, you know, within a two week window. And uh, so that way the guys can make plans. If you're going on a trip, you know, a lot of guys seems like February is the month for going on trips. So if yeah. you've got a couple of big trips lined up that are going to be trail trips and you think that, uh, you know, the, I'll say the kind of rider you are is similar to the, what I just described or how I ride, then I think that kit would really benefit you. And if you're a stand up guy that's just pounding over those big bumps and you can't wait to find, you know, I, I wouldn't suggest to buy that kit. So, um, you know, it's kind of, a, it's, it is a personal choice. And, uh, but I want to make sure that the guys who do pre-order that kit, 
you know, that they get delivered, I'm going to say what they want at that sled for, you know, when they order it, right? And is it gorgegarage.ca? No, Gorge Garage Limited, LTD. Okay, Gorge dot Garage yeah. LTD. And you just press the shop button. Is it dot .com or dot .ca? Gorge Garage Limited dot .com. Dot .com? Yeah. I'm just, just going to put it up on the screen here so that, uh, oh, okay. that everybody can see it. Hopefully um, it comes up then. But there we go. Is that the right spelling there? Words, Garage Limited. Yep, dot com. Yep, dot com. Yeah, so go on there in the next 24, 48 hours. You can check that kit yeah. out. Also, that bracket, which we're going to show shortly, too, which is pretty cool. Genius yeah. idea there. Oh, Thank this you. is this is probably that other picture that you're talking about. Okay, so there's the picture of the standard chalk, the way you get it. Yep. That's from BRP. That's And, and it can be just on that ring, right behind that adjuster ring, they've got a lock, a, kind of a lock ring behind that that they don't want you to turn back. So I had a question tonight and a guy said to me, well, hey, why do I need to buy that kit cord? Why don't I just take that ring and I'll back that ring off two and a half inches? Well, the problem yeah. if you back that ring off two and a half inches is you'll have no pressure on your shock when you go over any kind of a bump and that little collar down on the bottom will fall off. Like It will because like it's slotted, yeah. It's slotted. So. That, that ring on the top is so that you do not take as much pressure off it. So the only way to lower it down is you have to get rid of that spring and you have to go with a, a, an overall shorter spring in there. And are so you running a dual rate setup, did you say, on yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, nice. So I think I sent you the picture. Yeah, there you there. go. Okay. Yeah, perfect. So Should this is the there. kit here that we work with John at Accelerated Technology with. And he's he's had this around – you know, a uh, lot of experience in that. And you see the little white joiner in there? Can you, I don't know if you can close yeah, up yeah, on that. It's, it's, it, yeah, I, I, I can't really okay. adjust the size of it, but I wish okay. it was bigger, but, but that, okay. the white, yeah. It, that little white it, he's, he's replaced that whole collar with a tube that's actually got the collar attached, right? Yeah. For the so for right that side spot. there, the length of that, of course, is, is basically your lockout that adjusts how much you're going to be on that tender spring and how long, and then it'll join up and you'll be on the mainspring when you start getting aggressive. So in, in the way I look at it, it's the best of both worlds. You've got, because if you put something in there that's stiffer and shorter, it's going to shake you and rattle your head around and wear you down on those smaller bumps. But with that tender spring that's above it, uh, you, you're going to get a nice plush ride in that first you know inch or so of travel, right? If that's nice. what you want. And it's got 22, uh, 20 clicks of rebound adjustment. Uh, unfortunately, they took, you know, the compression adjustment. It's only three settings now on that. The old uh, KYB 40s used to have 20 clicks top and bottom or 22, depending on the yeah. model. So uh, we still got lots of adjustability on the uh, rebound. You're going to get the full 20 clicks in there. And you've got soft, medium, and hard for the compression. So... When you don't have as much range on the compression, it's really important to get the spring rate correct. And uh, John and his team did a tremendous job in getting that rate and spring correct. It, it's kind of cool because he did a lot of work on the links when it came out with, and it was a Pro 40 shock. So yeah. it's kind of uh, it's kind of been a good evolution for him to to yeah. to move into yeah. something like this, right? Yep. Yeah. Oh, there's my there's my favorite. That's my all time favorite picture of my of my 50 years of racing. That is Eagle River, 1994, when I won the world championship in Formula 250, and that was 20 years in the making. That picture, and that I'm going to tell you, Eagle River from Sydney is about well, it was then. It was about a 40 hour drive. Like I could go to Florida uh, probably yeah. in the distance and it would take us, you know, I, I remember so well, you know, the season would start off. It would be uh, right after the new year. It would be Owen Sound. We'd go to Owen Sound for the season opener. And then we'd leave the trailer in Ontario, drive back home, drive back up the next week. But, you know, it was, it was we could go faster because we didn't have the trailer. And we raced in Peterborough, and Peterborough uh, was always the week before Eagle River. So my my plan was 
If I won in Peterborough, I was halfway there. So oh. anyway, we went to Peterborough and I won the race in Peterborough, the Formula 250 class there. And I felt like, okay, uh, I, this, this could be the year. And uh, so anyway, the next weekend, no, not the next weekend, from that race, we left from Peterborough and drove to Eagle River. And it took me, uh, I don't know how many hours, probably 20 hours probably from there. But uh, anyway, we got down there. And the first time I did it, I finished third and came home, you know, with the tail between my legs, you know, thinking I was going to win it, you know, after winning Peterborough. I mean, it's like I say, it's like stepping up to the next level all the time. And, yeah. You know, Eagle, Eagle River is the cream of the crop. So I said, I'm going back the next year. I went back the next year, finished second. And of course, that's almost even worse. <laughs> so it took me uh, it took me three stabs to finally win it, and uh, I, I'll never forget that particular moment. My my longtime pit crew guy Robert Dix standing next to me there. You know he 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 wouldn't quit. He just he, he just wouldn't quit. Ted Otto, the flagman there, he's dead now. Um, you know and. In, interesting, interesting story for me is when I look at that machine, I mean, I, I, I've raced probably, I don't know, 50, 60 machines in my career, and I don't have that particular sled. And oh, that's when too I bad. Was, yeah, there was, that, that sled was a major thing in my career. I, I, I'm, maybe I'm a little, uh, maybe a little ashamed to kind of say it, but like I was flat broke. I raced every cent we had. I just about had put my store in bankruptcy. I'm not proud to say that, but I was so possessed on winning that. And my wife was just, you know, at home calling me and she said, look, you better get home. Like if you don't get home, you know, I, I don't know if we're going to make payroll this week. Like it's, it's really, you should not be racing. And I remember telling her, I said, look, if I can win this Eagle River deal, I, I, I'm done on oval racing. I will not race oval. And I can just remember her telling me, she said, well, I hope that you, when, when you're telling me this, that you'll never race oval after that. And I said, no, if I could win that race, I'll sell everything. Blah, blah. I would do anything to, to win that race. It was just, it was, I, 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 I know what it would be like. I'm not into drugs, but I, I was definitely on crack cocaine at that point in my life. <laughs> it, it was, <laughs> and it, it was like, me once you made that deal with her, she went. She was at the race putting sugar in all the competitors' gas. No, she, no, she, she, she wasn't there. And at that point in '94, uh, I had a Formula 250, and I also had a Skidoo twin track. And we, we, we left the twin track in the trailer that weekend because I knew I couldn't, I couldn't do a job on the two sleds. And I said, you know what? Um, we're going to concentrate and try to win that Formula 250. We won it. And I'm driving home, and I guess so Sunday would be the race, so probably around Tuesday, I was probably in around the Quebec area, and there was a race in Quebec the next weekend, and I remember, okay, I'm done. I'm, you know, I'm done racing. I got to sell everything. And I remember picking up the phone. I said, I'm going to be a couple more days. And she said, What? I said, I'm going to be just a couple more days. I, 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 I'm not backing out on the deal I made with you. I'm not going to oval race. I said, but there is a race in Montreal, and I'm going to race my twin track. And I raced the twin track the weekend after Eagle River. And, you know, I was on a major high after winning the 250 class. So I won the race in Formula One. It was the only time I won the actual final race in Formula One. Came home sold both sleds, you know, sold everything, you know, <laughs> everything that I could. And I have been, you know, trying to find that particular sled for the last 15 years, you know, wondering where it went, whatever became of it. And as coincidence would have it, about a week ago, a guy posted a picture of a white Formula 250 and he posted it on one of the sites and he said, does anyone know the history on this sled? And, you know, I looked at the sled, nothing rang a bell to me. And anyway, this guy sent him back a message. He said, yeah, I used to own that sled. He was from Quebec. And he said, and I sold that sled to Gordon McDonald in Nova Scotia, and he won the world championship. And I was like, 
oh my God, is that my sled? Anyway, I tracked the guy down. That sled, my sled is in, uh, is in Quebec. And uh, I said to the guy, I said, listen, man, I said, I would really like to see that sled. I haven't seen that sled in, well, 30 years, right? Yeah. And uh, anyway, so um, I'm going to make a trip out to, uh, to see that sled in the next little while. And uh, yeah, I, I never Are thought you, I'd see that sled. Do you think you can come home with it? Oh, man. I would love to be taking that sled home if he would, you know, sell it. But uh, I don't know if that's, uh, you know, like I said to him, I said, look, you know, there's only one uh, Eagle River for me. And I never, ever would have sold it if I didn't have to sell that sled. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. I got a bunch, I got a bunch of sleds, but none of them mean to me what that sled means to me. Right. Yeah. I, I can tell. Yeah. When you, when you sold it back in the day, do you mind if I ask what, something that would have sold for i think it was probably based on what i owed the bank <laughs> as i remember <laughs> like is it, uh, is it like are we talking 10 grand or are we talking more you know like, what well, I, I you know back then I, I i'm not exactly sure um i mean I, I i don't know exactly but i know to me it's priceless yeah, well, David Brennan says you must have raced with the Villeneuve's, did you? Certainly did, yeah. So uh, when I was in the in the twin track race, and I raced twin track for, uh, well, I guess, six years. So obviously, you know, we raced all over Ontario and Quebec. So, uh, you know, with the Villeneuve's, Vassars, Van Dolers, all those guys, um, you know, that, that was who I raced with every weekend. And, uh, you know, some of these guys that uh, that I met, you know, in the, when I raced the twin track, I don't know. If, do, you, do you have a picture of the twin track there? Uh, I'm not sure. We might. Uh, we can. Might have we'll have a look as we keep going. But yeah. Uh, yeah. when we raced twin track, it was uh, again. It was that next level up. It was you know the the cream of the cream, the fastest guys, the biggest sponsors, and I just loved racing with those guys. Like that that career was, you know. Uh, I, 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 I'm going to say to you uh, and, and the people listening, you know, when you're when you're a racer, um, you know, I was very fortunate that uh, a guy took me underneath his wing. I'll say, okay, and uh, Dave Wall and Dermont Wall were instrumental in in uh, in, in helping me. And I, I don't I don't know if they just you know. They couldn't believe how far that I would travel. That they took pity on me, or I didn't. It didn't matter to me. I didn't matter. You know, they were helping me. Uh, and it's not often a guy that you you race against. And and Dave Wall is a uh, you know a tremendous friend, long term friend of mine. Um, and uh, you know to go in the trailer and have a competitor genuinely help you try to get faster. You know, and uh, I'll never forget that. It was um, it, it, it meant a lot to me because racers are very private. They don't want to tell you too much, or they'll tell you something that's going to send you off the trail. Because hey, they want to win just as bad as you do. And uh, I can remember, you know, when I started racing twin track, I was like, you know, to make the finals. Um, you know, it was uh, it's quite a thing because you know you might have thirty guys and there's only eight spots or ten spots on the line. And uh, I was getting faster and getting faster. I mean, I, I crashed, you know, my earlier, I went through a couple of twin track hoods. It was no question, uh, you know, with those guys. I raced in Eganville, Ontario. I raced at Owen Sound. You know, I went, I landed out in the street in Owen Sound. We went through the plywood down there. I mean, it was, uh, it, 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 was a, it was a great thing. And I remember I always said, you know what, if I could just get to the final, get on the front row, if I could get on the front row, I think I could run with those guys. So anyway, by about the third year in twin track, you know, I was making the front row and I'll never forget the race. I got out there. It was in Valcor and uh, I was out front. Uh, got, it must have got a real good start or something. And I was going down the back stretch and it was coming down to the, the last, I'll say the last time. And uh, I figured I had this cover. And I said, I can't believe this. I'm going to beat Dave Wall. Dave Wall was in my heat 
and he's chased me now for the last four laps. It was a five lap thing. And I'm going down the back stretch, tucked underneath it for all I'm worth. And they go, one more corner. And I'm going to tuck on the inside because I said, I know he's going to come on the inside. If I slip, he's going to get me. And I kind of went right in. I thought I was making the perfect corner. And Dave Wall went around me on the outside, 10 feet on the outside, and went by me. It was just unbelievable to pass. Because usually to pass on the outside on a twin track, you can't see. The spray is just incredible. You know, it's just like passing a tractor trailer with the wipers on. Yeah, and uh, that's you, right. you, most, most guys, you've got to be a very nervy guy to pass on the outside in twin track, especially on a track that's got a lot of spray. And I was thinking I had this race. I had this race. And anyway, I didn't have the race. He passed me. I finished second in the race. And I come into the trailer and talked to Dave after the race. And he looked right at me and he said, what were you doing there in that last corner, Gordy? He said, were you practicing your acceptance speech? And I said, you know what? I was. I was thinking I was just going to thank you for all the knowledge you gave me and how nice it was. To he said, you know what? He said, I had to pass you because I don't want you to ever think you're going to take me on the racetrack. <laughs> and I'll never forget that. It was a, it was a great uh, it was a great lesson. And I had great respect uh, for Dave and Dermont. I ended up buying some sleds from them. I raced some Wall Brothers special in the single track days. And those guys, you know, they really know their stuff. I, 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 I've met some of the, I'll say, nicest people, um, you know, in my racing career, friends, you know, lifetime. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to kind of believe. You'd think that some of these competitors, you know, that you'd be arch enemies or whatever. It, it really, it wasn't like that. We, we all wanted to win and uh, it was an expensive uh it was an expensive sport. There was no question about that. But the twin track era, I was really lucky, I, I think, you know, that I that I was around uh, probably 35 years old at that time, probably at the peak of my career, oval racing, you know. And uh, anyway, so 1994, the last two races, world championship, won the twin track race, came home, never sat on an oval sled in 30 years and then just last week uh you know i f i find my my sled so i'm thinking there's maybe some good karma g going on maybe <laughs> maybe i might get my sled you know that is cool that is cool a uh, couple of compliments here uh owen zilstra says absolutely amazing episode and uh lapointe 800r says i can listen to gord's stories all day <laughs> That's a, well, I love that. I, I hope, I hope you can lay eyes on it and hands on it and hopefully you can buy it back. Cause that's, well, that's pretty. Yeah, I, I don't know. I really would love to have it in my collection. I, I may, I may have to offer him a trade or something else, I guess. Yeah. That comp behind you, maybe he'll go for that. <laughs> You'll be in your wife's bad books again though. Right. <laughs> Remember now I said I wouldn't oval race again. I started drag racing after that. <laughs> yeah, that's. I was gonna say you're after you did that, you come home, sold everything, bought it, the drags, the money. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Yeah, I. You know, I. I think one of the comments that you know she said to me when I came home from that trip, and she said to me, she said, you know, I really feel sorry for you, Gord. She said because you know if you were an alcoholic, you could go to AAs, but there's nothing you can't get a fix. Like you have to go to a race. And I go, you know what? I, 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 I got a problem. There's no question. There, I, there probably wasn't a, isn't a therapist on the planet that would have understood it either. Right. Like, well, like you know, it sounds, and I, and I don't it sounds really, to me like a gambling addiction. It really does. Well, right. You know, there's, um, I don't think unless you're really a true sled head that you can really understand what a guy would do to actually do that. Like, you know, if someone said, would you risk your business risk your marriage, risk everything on the line to win a trophy. And at that point in my life, absolutely, yes, I would never change. I wouldn't change a thing. That's awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Is this the twin track here? No, no, that's one of my drag sleds. That's a crank shop, uh, 1,000 cc that we raced on the ice. And at that time, it was a record of 5.291 seconds. 
Uh, that was, I can see, 2001. Yeah. 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 Pro and, Star and, 1000. Yeah. Yeah. And you see the guy holding on the end of that uh, thing right there? That's the guy who was with me in Eagle River, Robert Dix. The guy on the left? Yeah, the guy on the left on the end by the flag there, holding right the flag. On. Right on. Yeah, he's been a – and these guys that are standing behind there to this day, you know, are, are uh, still in my corner, let's say. That's cool. Love yeah. It. And so was that a – is that a 2001 – um, like what would that be? Would it be an 800? Oh, that, was, that probably started out as a 98 uh, CK3. Um, yeah. 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 There, I mean, same deal. It's just back then you had to have a stock chassis, but, uh, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of modifications you could do with the sled. Uh, yeah. That particular one had a crank shop engine in it. That was a, that was a real good sled. Do you, do you know our friends, uh, Kirk and Penny? No. No, no. Do, do you know what the Penny. Flying Dutchman? Do you know what the Flying? Oh, I, I know Dutchman? the Flying Dutchman very well. Like Peter, I raced against Peter and Andy, and uh, you know they were terrific people. And of course, huge, huge backers of the Owen Sound deal, right? Yeah, Kirk. Kirk is Kirk Hastings and Penny Hastings from Newfoundland. Oh, look at this it's here. Up. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Gordon, you yeah. have any idea the uphill drag race? So race on the rock. <laughs> All right, so Race on the Rock is an uphill drag race over Myrtle Mountain, Newfoundland. And uh, I was a regular attendee over there. Uh, I raced a sled over there called the Killer B. And the Killer B was a 1,500cc crankshop engine with nitrous that we used to climb that hill with. And if my memory serves me right, I won that King of the Hill three times in a row. And I think I sent you a picture of that killer bee. It's a black sled. Uh, oh my God, the loudest snowmobile. Like when I when when they would start that up in the pit, you just plug your ears. It was just ungodly the sound of it. It was just the most uh, obnoxious sled. But oh my God, would that thing climb a hill? Yeah, I think we had like a two inch uh, finger track on that thing. It was probably about 300 horsepower plus the spray. And, uh, you know, we used to use the spray. It was kind of comical. You know, the guy who set me up on this, he said, listen, the engine will probably last, you know, oh, Penny break the announcer for sure. Uh, you know, it'll probably <laughs> last, it'll probably last uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, two seconds, you know. So he said to me, Gord, whatever you do, don't hold the spray on for the full run. The engine will come apart. So I said, okay, no, I won't hold on the full run. So he said, like, if you can if you can make a few passes without spraying it, you know, this would be great. So anyway, I'd be going up the hill, and I'd have my finger on that button, and if anybody started getting close, I'd just give that thing, like, just enough that it would just go ahead because the engine had a life expectancy of probably, you know, 10 seconds max, right? But uh, it, it didn't matter. I was going to win the king of the hill, and uh, – that machine was just such a such a great machine. I I, I I hope you can find a picture of that. I thought I said yeah, you yeah. one. Yeah, we'll probably get there for sure. Kind of a black uh, killer bee. Yeah. This this is a fairly recent picture, I think, is it? Oh no, that's way back in the ice drag days. Is it? Right on. I can, yeah, yeah. Kimpex was my sponsor back then. I think that's a CKX helmet. I like it I is, look yeah. at the jackets. The jackets and the helmets, and I can pretty well tell the era, you know. Um, Very. In, that is a in, that's a cool piece of kit there, man. I love it. Love the color combo. Yeah, that's the traditional, you know, bumblebee, right? Yeah. Do you keep yeah. any old? Have you got any old vintage racing gear that you you've kept? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Sweet. Yeah. That's and awesome. there's a there's an ash that's on the pavement there. Yeah, that's the same sled that on from ice. No, to it's, a, it's actually a different sled. Oh, is it right yeah. on? Yeah, I had one for asphalt. Uh, I don't know what year that was. It's back, you know, on the like. I mean, you know, in the two thousands, I was going one hundred and fifty miles an hour. Yeah, that's you know? insane. Yeah. yeah. So um, anyway, that was a uh, okay. Yeah, there's some ice drag stuff there. So that was a Canadian yeah. championship. 
And yeah, uh, we're held on February 28th and 29th in Bathurst, New Brunswick. Gore McDonald, yeah. Lord ski now, the victory. Now, yeah, I, I'll tell you, the Bathurst story is the is the most incredible story because Bathurst is it's at sea level, okay? And the it's the only racetrack I've ever gone to. You know, if you wanted to set a record, Bathurst is where we used to go to try to set the record. And they used to take the Zamboni from the rink, bring it out on the ice, and <laughs> put the – I'm serious. It was just like a curling rink. And it's at sea level, and they had a Zamboni, and it was super, super fast. And, you know, teams from all over Quebec and New Brunswick, uh, Nova Scotia, you know, would come to Bathurst because – a the track and the zamboni. I don't like. I don't know who in the world would let a zamboni go out on the ice. And it wasn't, you know. I guess the ice was thick enough because I mean we used to park right out on the ice. I mean this was back when winters were you know minus twenty, minus twenty five every day, right? Right, right. Like, you couldn't do that. I mean you couldn't even have those races and bring all those spectators out on the ice. I don't think you know anymore. Well, there'd be insurance regulations. It'd be a but I mean, that was in, you know, the guy would be standing there with the flag. Yeah, yeah, we've got lots of ice, bring it over, you know, you know, you drive your truck out, the trailer, all the gear was left out on the ice, you know, like when I think about it, like it's, anyway, it was, it was, it was a cool period in my career for sure. That's wicked. He says here you had four first place finishes on Sunday, achieved first yeah. place results in Pro Stock 700, Pro Stock 1000, Factory Mod 1 and Factory Mod 2. Yeah, that, that is, yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, that's very, very unusual at, at at a Canadian championship to win four classes. That was like we were on fire that day, and uh, you know we had a seven hundred that was just really stout. We had a Neon Tomasi engine in it, and uh, it, it 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 was strong. Like we, I've, I've had some great relationships with some engine builders over the years. You know, um, Tomasi a, a huge engine one. in a seven hundred yeah. too, like. You know, when you've been in the racket as long as I have, you 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 have such a range of contacts. And uh, you know, when I call those guys and say, "Listen, you know, I need an I need an engine or I need this," and, and they know I'm very uh, anal. I mean, it might be the word, I, you know. Uh, but for me, it's super important that uh, things be done in a certain way. I, I I I really appreciate a guy who does take his time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, David says the radar runs back then were all over. <laughs> Look at this rocket. Wow. Yeah, that's – okay, 2006, at, we raced at the Sydney airport, okay? So they shut down the runway, and we drag that's raced on the runway. That was pretty cool. Like you could be flying in on a plane, and we'd be over on the other runway. And Very that particular cool. sled was a, was a Pro-Line chassis. And it was a turbocharged Yamaha in there. Now, that particular one, um, it had a turbo that was right up in your face. Like right in front of my face was the turbo. And that machine really a dangerous, dangerous setup. Like usually the, the turbo is red hot and you're yeah. looking right at it. And that is not the way to go down the asphalt track. Like I had my feet behind because you had to lay on it. and it is not the position you want to be in when you're going 160 mile an hour. I got to tell you, like that was a spooky, that machine was not made for that particular purpose, but uh, I was trying to set the track record at our local track with that, which it did. But I'm, I'm, I'm just saying to you, it uh, probably wasn't maybe my wisest choice. Don't try this at home is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, that was a great, uh, yeah, I love it. Is is the turbo underneath the little black windshield part, or is that the little round thing we can see to the on the yeah, right? Yeah, so there? the turbo is sitting right behind that little windshield. So if I yeah. lean my head down, like I'd put my face right into it. It was a it was a design that you know the guy who had built that particular engine. He was wanting the turbo as close as he could get it. And as you know, or I think you would know, the Yamaha engine is in backwards. So the pipes yeah. are facing me. And, uh, you know, so instead of it, uh, you know, going away from me, he had it right in front of my face. And I can remember going down the track and just looking down thinking that is red. And I mean, red hot. I don't know what temperature that turbo would be, but it, it would definitely, uh, 
do a number on you for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> can, wow. I, I can remember that because I had the whole hood painted full of flames. And uh, it, it, it was for a reason. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Corey Jinx says the flames added 10 horsepower. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? That, that's a wicked sled. It, yeah. did, were those bodies hand built or or how were they? Yeah, the, the pro lines are, are a custom built billet chassis. Yeah. But the, the actual hood, is that your design or is that a no, base? No, that's a carbon fiber hood, though. That's an oh, expensive sweet. hood on that one. Yeah. Back in the day when carbon fiber wasn't a real thing, right? Right. You know, so. So this there's something a, for if we, if we get anybody watching from Newfoundland, uh, that's that's a picture that was taken at uh, King of the Hill, Marble Mountain. Oh, I love that bottom picture. Look at that. See, but the buddy, yeah. the big guy with his ears plugged. Oh, See it wow. there? Yeah. Yeah, right oh, on. Yeah. When that thing lit up, it was just like a nitromethane car. It was just the snottiest engine I ever heard in my life. And that's a Mach Z, but did it have the 809? It was in a, yeah, a, a Mach Z body. That's what it started out as. And it was a 1,500cc three-cylinder crankshaft on spray. And, man, when like you could be going 100 miles an hour and push that button, and it was just like you started all over again. It would just set you right back in the sled. Wow. They, it, wow. It, and they used to race that. I think we were racing, when I think about this, probably eight or 900 feet up the hill. Now they only race, I think, five or 600 feet. It was crazy, oh. crazy fast. Oh, Those yeah. No, we didn't Those know any better back then, I guess. The, the wimps today, right? And they probably get participation ribbons as well, right? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> I, remember, I remember sitting on that. A, a, a guy came over in the stands, and he looked at me, and he said, well, but he said, I wouldn't sit on that for a bet. I remember looking at it and thinking, you know what? The guy seemed pretty sensible. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Gorgeous machine, though, man. I love the colors. Very wicked. Oh, this is a classic photo. Yeah, that's a classic. That's a Wall Brothers special. And that's me in the clutch. And uh, that, I, yeah, I remember that photo. Uh, so I was 202 in my earlier career. And then uh, yeah. Dave, Wall, Dave Wall told me, he said, we're going to change your number. He said to 88 because you're upside down so much. They can't tell the number. <laughs> So they, got, they mistook you for 505. They, they, yeah, they got upgraded to 88. Yeah. And then uh, 88 got upgraded to 88X when I got into the uh, uh, Formula One racing. So uh, the 88X is actually, we still we still use it. You know, that's that's kind of my the number that I'm known for. But I, I started out racing as 202. Yeah, that's awesome. Is this a twin track racer you're working on right no, here? That was, that, that's in single track. There was no such thing as twin back then. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. And then there, there's your Hall of Famer getting indicted into the – that's the Cape Breton, is it? Yeah. yeah Sport yeah. Heritage Hall of Fame. Very cool. Yeah. Congrats on that. Yep. Yeah. No, I was pretty excited. To, it was the first time that anyone had actually uh, got put in the Hall of Fame with a motorized vehicle, like Hall Seriously? of Fame in our town, it's all been uh, athletes, you know. Um, so to to be recognized as an athlete, you know, in a motorized sport, it was the first time they had ever done it, and uh, you know, it was a it was an honor for me to have it done in my uh, hometown, right? Yeah, very cool. Uh, yeah. that, that gets a wife off the back for a few days, a few hours. Yeah, right? well, it was, yeah, it was really cool. I got to bring my uh, my crew and my family, you know. And uh, anyway, it was a it was a real special uh, uh, special night. I mean, it's it's been really. Uh, I'm, I'm just realizing this as I'm yakking here to you. You know, it's it's been a it's, it's been a lot of fun uh, this podcast for me because a lot of the things I haven't thought about you know, in so many years. And uh, like when you said to me, you know, send me, uh, you know, 20 photos or something, you know, just uh, sort of some reference points. Like, so I started opening up the, uh, you know, the, the, the photo albums. And for me, it's kind of like, you know, going back in time, right? You know, you, you start thinking about, uh, 
the guys, you know, that are no longer alive anymore. And you, you, you think about how lucky I am to still be racing. And, you know, and, you know, I mean, I, I had lots of crashes. I mean, uh, you know, I was really trying way, way too hard. You know, I didn't, I didn't have the money. I did not have, I never had enough money to compete at the level I was at. I was always like, you know, a hundred bucks or a thousand bucks short, you know. Uh, I, I remember when I decided I wanted to get the twin track and the twin track at the time was like, I don't know, I don't know. I'm going to take a number here. Maybe it was $25,000. I, I don't know. Twenty wow. $25,000 yeah. back in 1988, let's say. And uh, I remember at the race shop, you know, I'd been racing the 250 and the guy said to me, okay, um, well, Gord, like we'd like to have you on a twin and race the sports series. And I said, yeah, I'd love to be there. You know, I mean, that would be wicked. He said, so all you got to do is, you know, get, send us a deposit, you know, send us, a, I don't know, maybe, let's say a thousand bucks or whatever. So that we're going to we're going to build one for you. And this is at the race shop. And uh, so, you know, hey, I had a thousand bucks that I had just made the week before in that last race. I took the thousand bucks out that I should have, you know, paid my gas bill with and hotel bills and all that. Gave him the thousand dollars. And I said, I'll figure this out. Like, I'm going to get a twin track and I'm going to race in the big league, you know. So anyway, you know, obviously a few months went by and uh, guy's talking to me. He just want to let you know, you know, we'll have your sled for you. Uh, I'm going to say October 31st, right? And, you know, we expect uh, when you come to pick it up, you'll have the balance, right? And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, the balance. What am I, how, what am I going to do here? So anyway, you know, all I knew was I had to have that twin track. So I went down to the local uh, – Oh, man, I'm not proud of this one. I went to the local radio station, and I said to the guy, I said, listen, I was in business then, and I talked to the sales guy, and I said, how about if I sell you some radio packages, and you give me uh, in spots, uh, we, we worked out a trade deal. So anyway, I ended up going around you know, to every business in town. And said, listen, would you like to buy some advertising on the local radio channel? And I go, well, not really, Gord. I said, okay, half the money that you're going to kick in, I'm going to get back so that I can go racing. And I'll put your name on the sled. And the guy said, wow, that's, that's, that's. so I'd get my advertising and I'm going to be on your sled and you're going to get some money. And I said, yep. I said, I need $20,000. In, in advertising so that I can pay for my sled, which I've already ordered and I had no money. So anyway, we went through that thing and uh, I sold, I don't know, whatever it was to raise the $20,000. And then the guy, one of my sponsors, I think it was Maritime Tell and Tell, it's a phone company anyway. And uh, they said, well, like, this is great, Gord, you know, we're glad to help you. But like, the reality is you race in Quebec and Ontario, like, What's that going to do for us? Oh, I said, oh, no, I didn't tell you because I realized I wasn't going to get them as a sponsor, you know, because I wasn't racing locally. I said, well, you know, the big hockey game, we got a big hockey game in town. Well, at the second period, I'm going to bring my twin tracker out on the ice. And everybody who bought advertising is going to be announced that you're my sponsor. So anyway, I went to the local rink, talked them into it. Now, you can imagine this in the middle of a hockey game. Let me come out on the ice, and I made a lap on the ice with my twin tracker. When I pulled the cord inside that arena, it was just craziness. The sound, you know, echoing, going through the whole place. But anyway, I lived up to my part of the bargain, and uh, that's how I got the twin track. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I need you to do some work on my uh, my podcast sponsorships. How's that? <laughs> yeah, we're, split the, we're gonna split it though. <laughs> you want to be a sponsor? That's right. There we go. That's awesome. Yeah, that's the Wall Brother special right there in Eganville. That picture was taken in Eganville. I can tell by the bales of hay because I was in them. <laughs> right on. How many things have you broken? Uh, Greg Kelly wanted to know about the crashes. Have you have you had anything? Yeah. To, you, oh, there's the twin track right there. There's right the on. twin tracker. Yeah. That's freaking awesome. Now that would have been a sled to have kept too. Oh wow. Man, this is yeah. this is heartbreaking watching this. 
do they do they like with the twin tracks you're turning more hardware obviously was this was a single track a lot faster or i guess it was oh, only no, 250 the though, right? the cornering speed of the cornering speed of the twin tracker was just incredible it, it only had a 340 cc engine but like your corner speed you could corner on that thing you know in the 80 and 90 mile an hour range it had a clutch really? on it when you turn the wheel it disengaged the uh track and it was just like wide open in the corners it was just like so was, so when you turn when you corner the one track speed slows down and the other one goes faster it's it, it, they basically almost had a little clutch in out of a motorcycle where it disengaged the inside track so yeah. the outside track had power on it which forced the, the machine to the inside like it was yeah. like i'm sitting on one track and on the other side of me, to the right-hand side, is another track. So there's yeah, two. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's why they call it twin track racing. That's I right. Mean, exactly. And with every one of us there. on the line was on a twin track snowmobile, so it was very close racing. Like you know, I I, I can remember Bruce Vasser and I going down the stretch in Owen Sound, and Bruce was a hell of a competitor. And anyway, both of us, both of us rubbed each other till we came right through the fire. There was no Gord Sports Center on the side of it when, when we finished racing, I can tell you that. Oh, I bet not, right? I bet not. That's where it becomes expensive is buying all the replacement parts because you want it to look good every race, right? Well, yeah, you want it to look good every race, but, you know, you also want to win races, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, in, unless you're lucky enough to get off the line and lead every lap, and there's only one guy doing that, right? Um, yeah. You know, you got to work your way through the pack, and uh, you know, the, the twin track racing would be the only thing I could, the only thing I could describe it would be, if you've ever tried passing a tractor trailer in the rain and your wapers stopped working, like if you were halfway up on the truck and your wapers stopped, you know that feeling when yeah, you just kind of get right. the out. Well, when you're going into the corners on those twins, you had two choices: when the spray came over you. You either had to hold it wide open and hope there wasn't anyone in front of you, because if you let the gas off, the guy in the back drove in you. What are you going to hit so you? It, yeah, it, it's very, uh, it's a young man's sport for sure, because uh, you know you you couldn't let the gas off, and you just hoped that the guy in front of you, you know, didn't derail or had an accident, because a lot of the corner was spent. Uh, I'm going to say you know, in the tractor trailer mode where you, you were at limited, limited visibility, right? Yeah. Wow. Is it, are they yeah. liquid cooled? Is that the, is that right? Oh, yeah. You're looking at right oh, there. Yeah. Right on. Yep. They were yeah. all liquid cooled engines. Yeah. David Brennan says the 440 CC made 120 horsepower. Yeah. That would be about right. Yep. Yeah. Right on. Yep. yep. See, I got right. very, I got very smart fans here. Very you smart. Know what? Fans. I, 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 I think you got some of the best fans uh in snowmobile because uh I, I i think if you weren't a fan of snowmobile and you would have tuned out here long ago <laughs> yeah, it's not, yeah yeah the uh except cory jinx he may not be a smart fan <laughs> i don't know kidding. i don't know why you're like why are you always picking on that guy <laughs> <laughs> only because we love him only because if, if it wasn't him. for cory jinx i wouldn't be here <laughs> it's true <laughs> I if Corey Jinks hadn't have bought, if Corey Jinks hadn't have bought the bracket, like yeah. think about this. If I hadn't have did the bracket and he hadn't have bought it, well, you and I yeah. wouldn't have had this happen. No, I'm glad. I'm glad he did. I'm glad he, he yeah. bought the bracket. I'm glad he so, did too. Yeah, exactly. So now he just has to buy more from you, and then it, it'll all work it all, itself out, right? So oh, there's my <laughs> other twin tracker. Oh, there's the other twin track right there. That's neat. Yeah. Right on. That, yeah. So what kind of records that, have you broke have you broke with that uh that sled records? Well, <laughs> the twin track sled? Yeah. The, the, the twin track sled, the record I broke was that I finally won a race in twin track. Like <laughs> twin track was not was not a easy spot to get a win. Like we used to have a lot of races where they'd have Team Canada versus Team USA. So it would be the top, they'd narrow it down, and the top four Canadians would go against the top four U.S. drivers. And it was, it was called the you know, U.S.-Canada Challenge Series. And I was very fortunate. I was in that top four 
Canadians almost, you know, on a regular basis. Um, you know, usually, uh, you know, the Viserys and Villeneuve, uh, you know, they were they were regulars because those guys were just incredible drivers, uh, you know, and incredible mechanics too as well. Um, so, you know, when we get to the Team Canada, we'd always kind of like, you know, the Canadians would always want to do is, you know, the best we could, and Team USA was no slouch. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, it was really – racing was just it, – it, 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 and especially in Formula One, where everybody was on the same stuff, it was a very – I've never been involved in racing that was so close, so competitive, and so, uh, you know, dangerous as far as the visibility goes. They, they, the spray was incredible, what would come off the back of those sleds. It'd be, it'd be like chasing a hydro, you know, a hydro yeah. boat through the corner, you know, only that you couldn't get away from them. What kind yeah. of speeds are you running in the oval? uh it would depend on the track uh it it would it would be common to get into that 90 to 100 mile an hour stuff um no question about that uh, especially if we get on one of those half mile horse tracks like you know you get into owen sound or anything like that that was a fast track uh you know some of the ones in peterborough were a little smaller and banked it was a little more manageable but you know when you get on a half mile horse track uh it was hammer down time. It was it was it was it was a time when you needed a big thumb and uh, <laughs> lots of nerve. That's wicked. Yeah. Oh, here you are in like mountain sledding. Yeah. So that that was on my bucket list. I found that picture. Um, so a great friend of mine, Carl Cooster. Who I met yes. through racing. Obviously, Carl and I go back years and years and years. Anyway, you know, Carl had always been ribbing me for years. You know, Gord. You know, you're, he, he he always calls me a, a flatlander. He, you know, we're, I'm a flatlander, right? He goes, "You got to come out here. You got to come out here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna show you how to drive in the mountains." You know, so that went on for maybe I don't know ten years or so, all the ribbon and whatever. And finally, I said, "You know what, Carl?" I'm going to come out there and see what you're all about, you know, and, and I never went to the mountains in my life. And I, I'll, I, I can, I can remember this so clearly. My wife came with me on the trip. And after that event was over, she said to me, she said, you know, if you had told me that what you were going to do, I would never ever have come on that trip. Like that was so outside uh, her comfort zone. And I, I got to take my, my hat off to her that she, she went through that because it was about, oh, I guess eight or nine guys. She was the only girl, uh, you know, that was on that trip. And uh, anyway, we, we got to a section that, uh, you know, I, I think I got to say at this point, as much as I knew Carl, I, and I knew he was a, you know, a terrific uh, driver. Okay. But I never fully understood just how good he was until I rode with him. And I remember going out there, and one of the guys told me, he said, Gord, I'm going to tell you something. Whatever you do out west when you go out on that trip with Carl, he said, you're never going to impress him. There's nothing you can do to impress Carl Cooster. And I said, yeah, you're probably right. But yeah. Well, and anyway, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, you know what? I'm going to try to see if there's something I can show Carl, you know, because uh, I just, it was just that competitiveness, right? So my strategy, this is my strategy. So we, we unload and we have to drive about, you know, 20, only about 20 miles on this broom trail to get to the area where the bowls are and all the big mountains are, but there's like a bit of trail ride. So I thought, well, you know what? I'm not going to show him anything when I get to the mountains because obviously he's got so much experience. But like I'm, but I'm going to show him when I get on that trail with that summit. Now I never drove a summit in my life, okay? So <laughs> I get on this 174 summit with a ski stance of about seemed like about 20 inches wide, <laughs> and you had to stand up on it and a steering post that's like you know way up in the air. So I'm going along and I'm struggling, and I said, well, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Carol's out front. All these guys are following behind. I'm going to pass all these guys. 
on the groom trail, and I'm going to go right up to Carl and go right beside him just to show him, you know, how well I can drive. So we started going, and I started passing a few of the guys, you know, up on the trail, you know, not, not making it, not dangerous passes, but enough that I passed them and I could see up ahead. And I thought, you know what? I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm catching them. I'm catching them. I'm, I'm catching them. I'm catching them. I'm going to catch Carol Coaster on the trail and I'm going to pass them. And I'm coming through the dust and that two and a half inch paddle is throwing up like just a monster spray. And I'm getting closer and I'm getting closer and I'm thinking, okay, okay. I'm, and I looked up and I thought, this is weird. He's standing with his two feet on one running board. And I thought, we're going straight. <laughs> when I get to him, he's actually on the cell phone talking. That's how I caught him. Oh, my God. That's how good that man can ride. He could ride better than I could ride two feet on one running board with a cell phone stuck inside. <laughs> and I thought I, I, I was too embarrassed to even tell him or anybody that I was chasing him and that I caught him. But in my mind, you know, I was catching him and catching him and catching him. And when I finally got to him, he was on the phone. <laughs> no, that's hilarious. Yeah. You, you oh, don't want man. to tell him. I was, wasn't racing yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like he is a, you know, for a guy like me that comes from just oval racing, drag racing, whatever, to go out there in the mountains and spend, you know, three or four days with him. It was such an experience, you know, it, it, it's funny, you know, as you probably know, people who are really, really good at a sport, they make it look so easy. You know, it almost gives you the sense that uh, like anyone can do it. Yeah. You don't realize when you see someone, you know, going really, really fast and really, really smooth, it almost looks effortless. But uh, it's it, it, it's such an art to, to, to see that and appreciate it. So anyway, Carl and I are great friends and we had a terrific trip and a memory that'll last, you know, lifetimes for both me and my wife for sure. He's a he's an amazing rider for sure. That would yeah, be a, yeah, that would be a dream, yeah. a dream trip for sure. Um, oh, yeah. and a solid guy too, man. Just solid, solid. Yeah, absolutely. David says if you uh he said do you remember the wings on the front of sleds? They tried them in the 70s and Skidoo he thinks that Skidoo had them banned. Yeah, they did have that. He's correct. Yeah, uh, that was on the original twin track. Jacques Villeneuve had it on his sled. Um, uh, mixed results on that. They were they were kind of copying a lot of the arrow off the stock car stuff. It only lasted, I think, maybe for one season or even maybe half a season. That, that sled is actually in a museum um, down in Eagle River. Um, there's not many of those that actually had the wing on them, right? Oh, that's cool. What was happening yep. with them? Were they flipping or what was? What was uh, well, you know, <laughs> as soon as you crashed it, the wing was the first thing that went, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Very difficult to keep the wing on if you're <laughs> yeah. if you were in any kind of scuffle with it, right? Yeah. Pretty crazy. Pretty yep. crazy. Yeah. So the, you, we've got some awards here that you've won. This is a congratulations. 35 years of passion and dedication from BRP. Yeah. That was a, I was very happy to receive that. They, the guys from BRP come down to the store and when I retired and uh, handed me that, I sold, we sold the business in 2019. And uh, that was really a nice, a nice touch uh, to be recognized for that. I mean, I go back with the BRP, you know, right from the start of my career, I started out on a skidoo and obviously, you know, I had some stuff in between there, but uh uh, obviously, uh, uh, I guess if they say I, I, I wear the yellow underwear, right? Yeah, that's, that's right. What, that's, what the, that's what the Frenchman say. Yeah. Gord, he wears the, the yellow underwear. He, he's, a, he's, a, he's the BRP, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is the 2007 North American Public Relations Dealer of the Year as well. How oh, yeah. Your dealership was small. Like, is it a small market where you are? Yeah, we. My 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 son tells me that uh, that uh, we were the smallest, largest dealer that BRP ever had. <laughs> really? It's like you know we have a very small population. We're way out in the middle of uh, you know uh, the Far East for sure, and uh, yet I I probably know you know 
90% of the dealer network and a lot of the, the guys at BRP. Um, it, it was a great, it was a great relationship. I, I, I was just so fortunate to, uh, to be involved in the, and not quit, I guess. It's maybe that's the right word for it. Very cool. And the can am off-road 2019 district dealer of the year. Yeah, so when did, you, when did you retire and sell the business? Yeah, we retired uh, 2019. Um, I, I was mentioning this. I, I, I had two boys. And, uh, you know, I guess when I started out, you know, started out in the dream back in 83, I was pretty sure that, you know, one of the boys, you know, hopefully maybe take over the business. You know, that's probably like every father's uh, dream that their son is going to take over, you know. And uh, anyway, that didn't happen. Both my boys, uh, tremendous careers and family. And, you know, uh, it, was, it was becoming obvious, you know, probably, you know, that they're, they're not going to take over the business. And, uh, you know, like my wife said to me, you got to remember, you know, this was your dream. It's, it wasn't theirs. Right. And, uh, and, and that's true. I mean, you know, so I, I had an opportunity to sell my dealership in 2019 after 36 years. And, uh, I stayed on for a couple of years after I sold it. And, uh, then I decided last year it was time to, you know, go to Gord's garage and time to go to the garage and just do the things that I wanted to do. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy that I was in the business for that long. And I'm, and I'm also really happy that, uh, you know, I, I, I got to sell the business and uh, to uh, start Gord's garage. And now we got a little e-commerce thing going, which is, you know, just totally, totally, totally unexpected. You know, the, 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 the bracket thing has just kind of changed my whole, uh, the whole garage it's kind of like okay uh, what's the next thing you're going to invent blah 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 you know that's pretty awesome yeah <laughs> yeah well it sounds like you always have to be doing something yet right yeah yeah cool. so this is the bracket here is it yeah yeah Sweet. that is the that is the bracket and uh you know great great story uh on the bracket i i had the sled here and uh you know, I was really bummed out. I, I, I really liked to carry that little tail bag behind it. You couldn't put the bag on it. And I was like, man, 30,000 bucks. And you can't even put a bag on this damn thing, you know? And I was looking at it and I said, well, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make a gadget and put it on. So I made a couple of different designs, you know, and anyway, and I got the bag on and I had a whole bunch of straps on it. And, and my, my oldest boy, uh, Jeff, he was here at the time. And, and he said, he's walked by and he said, you know, dad, you should really show that bracket, you know, to, uh, to Paul and, uh, Paul Perdom and I are old friends from way back. And, uh, you know, I showed it to Paul and I said, you know, I got this figured out, you know, I'm going to put some straps on it. And, uh, Paul said to me, Gord, you know, straps is like, you know, 20 years ago, we used to put stuff on with straps. He said, like, you know, you got to make it for like, you know, if you really want to make a bracket, you got to make it for link. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I, I went back home and start, start, thought about it a little more. And I thought, you know what? And he's probably right. You know, I guess the straps, you know, that's kind of old school. But I mean, it worked and I would have had the bag on. So, anyway, I redesigned the bracket a couple of different times and kept working on it. And, and I realized that the problem with the bracket was that if you mounted the bracket like a 16th or an eighth of an inch, plus or minus on that slope the the, the bag wouldn't fit in right. so the bracket has to be you know exactly in that spot at that height in order to work so i thought well how could i make it you know and paul said to me he said well you know can you make a few of these and i said well sure i, I can make a few i mean i you know what are you talking like two three he said no 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 like you know quantities and i go no i can't make them in quantities <laughs> and he said well if you know if you can make that in a quantity you know he said i think guys would like that so anyway i i took my uh, uh my my rough i'll say uh thing and luckily in town here we got a business called proto case i don't know if you ever heard that name but no. they make carts for nasa they make carts worldwide 
They've got like the latest technology. So I took it down there and I showed the guy and I said, look, can you make that bracket, like duplicate what I got here? And he said, uh, yeah, we could do that. And uh, he said, like, and how are you going to mount it? And I was telling him the problem. And he said, well, here's what we're going to do. He said, I think we can make it even better. And I said, okay, what do you, he said, you bring me the tank cover. And they took the tank cover and they scanned it with a 3D scanner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they made a template. So where it says Gord's Garage, that little, that little crazy shape. Yeah. That fits perfectly inside that little indentation. Cool. And I took it back home and I drilled those holes in exactly that spot so that the bolts wouldn't touch the tank. And yeah. he said, okay, we're going to cut that out with a laser and we're going to powder coat it. And then we're going to laser engrave your name into the bracket. I'm like, that's wow, sweet. that's, that's going to be like, that's going to look so cool, right? So yeah. anyway, they made one and then I took it home and, you know, showed it to a few people and they were like, yeah, you know, that, that's really, I think this is going to work. So uh, anyway, we made the bracket and then I figured out a way to hook the bracket up on the back that wasn't complicated at all. Like when, like when I look back, I made five or six, I, I don't know what it is, but I, I, I have to make it wrong in order to make it right. I can't, I, I, you can't, you can't tell me it's wrong. I have to make it wrong. So I made five or six different versions, but this little version here, I, I, like I can sell it to somebody and they can take it, they can put it on their sled. You need two or three, I think it's four tools. And the only danger is, you know, you can't drill the two holes while it's on the machine because you'll drill a hole right in your fuel tank. No, that, so that gotta, wouldn't be good. <laughs> yeah. So I made a big video that shows you how to put it on and uh, put instructions in it, English and French. And, you know, I, I think for our first product, it came out. Uh, I, I'm really I'm really proud of it. It's the first thing that we've ever, you know, actually sold and made and designed. and. But again, it's that same thing, you know, you collaborate with some other people and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I've been very fortunate to uh, probably have such great range of contacts because when you're trying to do something, like it's so much easier when you got a team and you don't have just one, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Are you, are you going to patent this? I don't think so. I, 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 <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Like uh, we've been selling them in the U.S., uh, we've been selling them in Canada. And uh, cool story here. Last night I get a message from a guy in Norway, and the guy in Norway, I don't know where he saw the bracket, but he said, "Hey, uh, Gord, uh, you know, do, do you ship to Norway?" And I'm going, I have no idea if I could ship to Norway, but I was thinking how cool it would be, you know, to sell a bracket. I told Buddy, I said, I'm going to guarantee you one thing. You'll be the only guy in Norway with a Gord's Garage mountain bracket. That's so, awesome. Anyway, he, he hasn't bought it yet, but uh, I got my fingers crossed that maybe we might sell him a bracket. That's wicked. You global business already. There you go. Oh, yeah, okay. Very cool. Yeah, there, there it is. is in so, yeah. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. So there you can see where the Gord's Garage bracket fits right in that little spot. Yeah. And then we supply the spacers and the brackets. And basically, when you buy your bag, you, you use your existing link base bracket that comes with it. And uh, anyway, so we made a little video on how to put it on. And it's I mean, it's literally five minutes. A guy can put that on. You can put your tail bag on. You can put a combo bag on. It's been a it's been a great little seller. I think we're, we're going to have to probably run another batch of them because uh, we're, we're actually getting low on them now. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Very cool. And they Good can get work. that on the website. Yeah. Oh, there it is with the bag on. There yeah, you go. Yeah. Genius. Genius. Yeah. It's such a great bag. You know? Yeah. yeah. So you just pop that bag off, you know, one one lever, and you can fill your ice tank, right? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. 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 Not not bad at all. Yeah. Here's that. We were, we were talking about this. And I said, is that you on the motorcycle above? Oh, well, yeah. That's that, me. You, you and your wife there. Pretty great. That's yep. awesome. So these are these are different rides, charity rides that you've done and raised money for. Well, that that, that was that was an idea, and I you know, and again, when you collaborate, my my it was my wife's my wife's idea, um, you know, and uh, my mom had uh, my mom had passed away with breast cancer, 
and uh, you know, I I was I was in the motorcycle business, and uh, you know, I thought you know it'd be great if we could you know have a ride and maybe raise some money you know for the local hospital, and uh, you know, so we sent a little thing out you know and said, hey, you know, you guys want to meet me down the casino. You know, we're going to ride around the Cabot Trail and, uh, you know, we're going to have a, it was a, at that point, it was a poker, a poker run. And, you know, I talked to the guys at the casino. Can I use your parking lot? And, you know, we'll do this and have some draws. And, you know, and I was, you know, thinking, okay, maybe we get, you know, I don't know, 20, 30 bikes, you know, in the first ride. And I can remember coming around the corner, you know, on the bike and I looked in the, casino parking lot and the parking lot was filled filled with motorcycles and you know we had pink ribbons and we put the pink ribbons on the guys so they knew we were in the ride and you know I, I'm looking at that check I think we raised maybe like five thousand dollars in that first year I'm looking yeah there's five ten thousand the first year and then it goes okay. all the way up to 121 thousand on your on the the last yeah, one. on the last. So I mean, it started out, you know, it was going to be a small group of guys and raise some money and blah blah blah. So you know, nine years went by, and that last one that I did, it was kind of you know the granddaddy. We were going to like, you know, try to make the most money we could. I mean, it was just getting out of hand. We had like eight hundred motorcycles. We had the cops there. They had RCMP on bikes. You know, it was it was like just take over the cab of trail. And one of my uh, one of my customers, you know, I'll say a year or two previous um, gentleman by the name of Kevin Link. Anyway, terrific, terrific guy and friend. He had cancer himself and he came to me and I'll, I'll never forget this he, in my office. And he sat down and he said, listen, Gord, he said, uh, I I I I uh I want you to sell my 1948 Indian Chief. Now, I don't know if you know much about motorcycles, but a 48 Indian Chief is like a very rare and expensive motorcycle, okay? And uh anyway, I said, "Well, Kevin, man, look, I I, 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 I no no, I, He said, "Listen, I want you to have it." He said, "Uh I I got cancer." And I'm probably not going to be around for the next year. And he said, like, I know what's going to happen. He said, somebody's going to come up to my wife after I'm dead. They're going to steal that motorcycle from her. He said, I know if I, uh, if I give it to you, you know, that you'll, you'll, you'll get the maximum amount of money out of that. And all the money you raise in that bike, um, it's going to go to the hospital. So anyway, going on this last ride, I knew it was my last ride. So we had a professional uh, auctioneer come in from Halifax, all buddy of the suit and tails, and, and was he slick? And we had uh, we had uh, people bidding on the bike, and then we had the phone lines open. We had people bidding from other provinces. It it turned into a it turned into just an amazing amazing event. Like I mean, when you think about you know a group of guys on a motorcycle driving around the Cabot Trail raised $121,000 in one day on that ride. Yeah, it was it was just monstrous, but it was just yeah. it was getting out of control. Like in every year I was making it bigger and bigger and it was just getting like it's going to blow, it's going to burst, right? And yeah. uh, anyway, so the I think the total, you know, was $637,000 that we had raised over that 10-year run and uh ride for the cure is you know, in this town is a is a is a hugely known uh, yeah. deal. You know. Wow, good job. So, That's yeah, it was awesome. a it was a real it was a real fun thing. So you said, show me something that's not connected to snowmobiles, and like, unfortunately for me, it's both the only thing that's not connected to a snowmobile. No, that's why. Well, no, that's really good work. That's why good things come to you is because doing things like that. You know, karma karma comes back to you tenfold, right? Hundred percent. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, Kirk and Penny said it's it. They think that it's time for some uh, some Bill Fullerton stories. 
Oh, we don't. Oh, no, no, no. This is this is what you call after you have two or three drinks and then someone brings something up, right? <laughs> they think, yeah, Gordon, Gordon, Gordon's going to spill the beans on this one. Yeah, no, yeah. Oh, we're, I'm, no, they, they, uh, they're probably halfway into the Newfie Screech right now, probably. Yeah, no, great, great, great people, Newfoundland, man, I'll tell you. I, we <laughs> always say over here, the only difference between a Cape Bretoner and a Newfoundlander is 30 minutes. It's yeah. only the time. <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. No, So how do people follow you? Uh, do you have social media channels? Um, we already talked about your website there. So your website's no, the best this, place. Yeah, we're we're we're, we're going to obviously have to start getting involved in this if we want to do this e-commerce deal. But uh, at this point, it's just Gord's Grand Limited, and uh, I think uh, we're gonna we're gonna probably try to you know expand this a little bit because uh, I, I really enjoy staying connected to the uh, snowmobile community, and I I don't want a full time job. But this could this could work out really nice for me. Um, you know, it's a, be a part time gig, and we just look after snowmobiles kind of there. So anyway, it's uh, it's it's just it's just been a it's just been a great ride, and I, I don't want to get off yet. <laughs> no, no, I can tell you're passionate about it for sure. Uh, Corey says, "Tell Gord I knew he'd kill it tonight." <laughs> LOL. Yeah, great show, Gary. Yeah, yeah lots of compliments coming in. So. Um, no, I think it was an aw awesome show. I I just love your personality and your stories. And like someone had pointed out earlier, I could uh, I could sit there and listen all night on things like that. So um, yeah, it's, it's been uh, a lot of fun. For, it's been a lot of fun for me looking back. Uh, you know, I I I, I want to say thanks. You know, to, to Corey and you for inviting me on because I, I I've never done anything you know like this. Uh, and it's kind of coming at a time when, uh, when uh, it's, it's good. To, it's good for me. I'm I'm happy with this. Yeah, you're doing you're doing some good things, and the fact that you're going to give Corey and I 33 percent each of the sales of the brackets, then we're really <laughs> yeah, we're really we're really thankful for that. Uh, Corey, Corey well, can have 33 percent of the bracket. Saying, I'm not saying. I'm not saying no, but you're definitely going to have to be a sponsor of my race sled this summer. <laughs> The uh, I I've already sponsored my son's race. <laughs> okay, all right, you're 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 or trail you out, sled, I say, yeah. yeah. Chris Barber says awesome show. Oh, David Brennan says, have you heard about the 1,000 cc two-stroke rotary that Skidoo made in the 90s? Yes. Apparently, thought it was yes. too much for the general public. And did you have any experience on that? No, I never got my hands on one of those. I uh, I, I I do know about the engine he's talking about and. And David seems to be very knowledgeable on this uh, Rotex stuff in the '90s. I love that. That's uh, that's kind of cool. I mean, it's it, it's it's great. Uh, you know, all these advancements uh, that they're making in the new sleds. But you know, I I I really enjoy the uh, you know the I'll say the golden age uh, of uh, racing. You know, in the in the '70s and the '80s, and you know, it, it was uh, it was a different time and. Uh, but you know what? Things got to got to change. It can't stay the same, right? It's got to always no, that's change. That's right. That's right. No, I love things like that. Eight fifty turbo behind you is amazing. Like it's yeah. uh, it's neat to see that the that everything's advancing for the for the right reasons, right? Yeah. 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 I think sure. so. I think so too. I just wish the prices weren't advancing quite quite so much. But yeah, yeah. We, I I think the industry got caught with their pants down after all the COVID buyers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They had no. Yeah. They had no choice but to raise the prices, and now we're now things are softening up a bit, and you know, I think I think it's you can't go back, right? You, you can't lower the prices once you've raised them. No, I guess not. Yeah. So who knows? But anyway, we won't take any more of your time. I thank you very much. We're almost three hours. We're encroaching on here. Whoa. So yeah, I know. I told you time flies, though, right? Oh, okay. I I, I thought we were still on the one hour show. Sorry about yeah. that. <laughs> I told you fifteen minutes. We're a little bit over the fifteen minute mark here now. But yeah. no, that's that's great. I thank you for your time tonight. Good luck in all the sales on that. And uh, yeah. let's let's chat more. I probably will. Uh, I'll probably uh, have some people I can send your way for that bracket, and uh, and we can we can keep chatting on that. For sure. I'd like to really appreciate it. And thanks for uh, all, all the time you've given me. And uh, 
I hope uh, people that were uh, listening, uh, you know, enjoyed the show tonight. Oh, I think I think everybody did. I'm going to roll the credits. If you just want to hang out until the stuff stops, finishes recording, uh, we'll, we can talk off the air. So that's great. Okay. Thanks again. We'll see you guys next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Fan photos are brought to you by... It's a journey for life.